Okay, we can now move on to the public recognition portion of the meeting. Dr. Manor, I'm going to turn it over to Olaf. Olaf, you're oh, in okay. charge tonight, buddy. <laughs> Hello. Hello, all. <coughs> you flying solo again tonight? Hello. <laughs> I have a new friend. His name is Tyler. You might know him. Uh, He's pretty popular yeah, sure. around here. Absolutely. So uh, starting off our presentation, January is School Director Recognition Month in Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a time to spotlight the contributions of public school board members. Uh, communities throughout the Commonwealth will take time this month to recognize school directors for their time and dedication to our public schools. Those who, those who serve as school directors truly are public service volunteers. They oversee multi-million dollar budgets, deal with taxation and funding issues, ensure that we have highly qualified teachers, and develop uh, policies that support learning, safety, personnel, and finances. By taking the initiative to serve our community, members of the North Hills School Board have made a commitment to the long-term viability of Ross Township and Westview Borough. These for forward-thinking individuals are committed to ensuring public schools remain a solid foundation for American Democrats or democracy and serve as shining examples for the students to continue the excellent tradition of volunteerism a hallmark of our society we would like to thank the board members in a very special way a book has been purchased for each school library in honor of a particular board member and in front of the book there is a book plate dedicating the book in your honor the books may have been chosen on a subject that is particular interest to you, or it could be a book that a school's library really wanted to have. Mm -hmm. In addition, each board member will receive a piece of pottery created especially for you, our high school pottery students, to thank you for the support of the arts. Will the students, will the students who have been selected to honor our board members this evening please join us at the podium? We're going to uh, just start it off for you really quickly while we're up here, uh, you know, just to keep it going. Sure. <laughs> so our first acknowledgement of the night, we are going to have Dr. Nolish. Uh, first of all, thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. You have done so many great things for our school district. Um, so to begin, Dr. Annette Nolish comes as a name you may recognize. She is a lifelong resident of North Hills and even raised her family here. I believe my sister even graduated with your son, Andrew, uh, in 2015. Uh, it's similar to Dr. Nolish, the subject of our book choice for her may strike a familiar heartwarming tone in your hearts. Uh, 
The Good Neighbor, The Life and Work of Fred Rogers is the full-length biography of the late Pittsburgh celebrity Fred Rogers. This book is chosen specifically for Dr. Nolish for numerous reasons. For instance, both Fred Rogers and Dr. Nolish committed themselves to bettering their community or, in Mr. Rogers' case, bettering his neighborhood. Uh, Fred Rogers dedicated his life to children, preparing them for the hardships ahead in the world while demonstrating the good that can also be found in life. <clears throat> Dr. Nolish has had similar influence on children throughout her time as both the president of the Instrumental Parents Association uh, and now on the North Hills Board of Education. Uh, in addition, she possesses a passion for music as Mr. Rogers shared his passion uh, on live TV on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Uh, she continues to share her passion uh, performing violin today, if I'm correct. Uh, ultimately, Dr. Nolish had this specific book chosen for her due to her quality similar to the late Fred Rogers. In the end, uh, both are kind-hearted, dedicated, intelligent, and incredible influences to us all. Dr. Nolish, we hope that you can find a little bit of yourself in this book as we have found in you. Thank you so much. Mrs. Helen Spade truly embodies the spirit of our North Hills community. She served as a member of the Board of Education since 2015, but her impact on this school district extends well beyond these past four years. Not only did she work in the facilities department in the school district for 39 years, she spent much of her time invested in various community organizations that directly impact the life of students and faculty here at North Hills. She served as an officer of the SEIU Union for numerous years, and she continues to work as a member of the Allegheny County Schools Health Insurance Consortium. Her dedication and continuous efforts to impre improve her community demonstrate a profound sense of compassion and loyalty. As a young student in this district, seeing the effort she displays inspires me to go forth and use my education to better the world around me. Mrs. Spade is not only defined by her accomplishments, she leads a wonderful life outside of the school board. She and her husband, Bill, have been married for nearly 55 years, and they share two children and six grandchildren. This year, we have dedicated or we have decided to dedicate a book in her honor. The book we have chosen is titled Ruth Bader Ginsburg, A Life. The biography encaps encapsulates the life of one of America's most profound minds in our government's history. Ginsburg truly defines the meaning of a strong female voice. Before being appointed the second female justice in history, she balanced her life as a mother and hardworking student. In this way, Mrs. Spade exhibits those admir admirable characteristics of a strong woman, one who can balance all of the challenges of life and perform her duties well. It is truly an honor and privilege to watch and reflect upon the work Mrs. Spade has done to make my school and our community a better place to learn and develop as a young citizen. I feel that this biography is a wonderful representation of the appreciation North Hills has for one of our school board members. Thank you so much for all the work you've done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tyler. <laughs> Hi, my name is Coulter Mathis, and I am a seventh grader at North Hills Middle School. I'm a part of the band and also am in the book club. My mom, Allison Mathis, <laughs> has run eight marathons and goes to the gym whenever she can. She's incredibly dedicated to making the school district as great as it can be. The book we are dedicating to the middle school library in honor of my mom is Bringing Back Our Oceans, part of the Conservation Success Stories book series. Bringing Back Our Oceans uses case studies to dive into reasons why our oceans are at, risks, are, are at risk and how people are combating plastics pollution, restoring marine biodiversity, and preserving our oceans for future generations. High quality photos accompany the text throughout the book, and the author includes an informative cause and effect chart, a list of essential facts, and websites for further investigation. 
making this book a perfect choice for a research project about biomes that I will soon complete in the library for my 7th grade science class. This book is a great choice for my mom because she cares a lot about animals, wildlife, and especially sea turtles. You could say she really goes out of her way to celebrate wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, every time we go to the aquarium, she goes to the turtles to take a shelfie. I'd like to thank her for everything she's done for the NHSD school board. This book will be a great addition to the library selection. <laughs> Hello, my name is Haley Coyne. I am a seventh, grader, a seventh grade student at North Hills Middle School. I am in service club in an orchestra where I play a violin. Tonight I'm honored to present a book for the, from, from the middle school library dedicated to school board member Mr. Lou Nudie. For over 30 years, Mr. Nudie has been a resident for, in the North Hills School District, having graduated from Westview High School. Mr. Nudie's sons, Christopher and Michael also are North Hills graduates. His higher education includes in Valley Forg military, in military College and earning degrees in both business administration and economics form in the University of Pittsburgh. Mr. Nudie spent 16 years working at Westinghouse in a procurement project management, sales, and marketing. He is currently a self-employed at a manufacturer's agent in industrial fasteners, machines, machining, stamping, stampings, and fastening systems. Mr. Nudy has been a member of the North Hills Board of Education since 2007 and, it, and has also served on the Pennsylvania School Board Association's nominating co com committee and a legislative platform com committee. He is a member of the American Legion Veterans of Foreign Wars, Cranberry Elks, and St. Sebastian's Parish, and he supports the Autism Society of Pittsburgh by fundraising at the Pittsburgh Vintage, Vintage Grand Picks. For fun, Mr. Nudie enjoys cooking, skiing, and working on his 1986 Alfa Romeo. <laughs> Of all his lifetime's accomplishments, the one I would like to make special mention of is that Mr. Nudie served seven years as an Army officer and as a Vietnam veteran. So the book that we have chosen for our school library in Mr. Nudie's honor is an updated copy of the 50 Heroes Every Kid Should Meet. I'm especially proud to present this book to him because my dad has also served in the Marines for six years. Students in the middle school will enjoy and be inspired by reading about the incredible stories and American activists, servicemen and women, scientists, musicians, inventors, athletes, and more. The updated copy of this book includes 10 new heroes and with additional websites and book list. This book will be a valuable research tool as well. Thank you, Mr. Nudy, for your service to our country and to our school district and committee. We hope you enjoy reading about these heroes as much as we will. Hi, my name is Aaron Williams, Thank and I am a third grade stu student at Ross Elementary. The book I chose to add to our school library in honor of school board member Sandra Cozella, my mom, is called Anna P. Gable's Cookbook. I chose this book because my mom likes cooking, and she also loves the book Anna P. Gables by Kate, by L. M. Montgomery. I also share my mom's love for Anne of Green Gables. One of my favorite things to do with, with my mom, one of my favorite things to do is cook with my mom, and my favorite food to cook with her is pumpkin bread. This book will be available to all students at WAS and will hopefully give them opportunities to be begin cooking with their parents too. Mom, I am proud of you. Your development to support a North Hills school district. Thank you for being involved in the future North Hills students. Hello. Hello, my name is Olivia Slegel. I'm a third grade student in Mrs. Ross's room at Ross Elementary. 
I would like to take this time to celebrate the memory of Miss Arlene Bender by dedicating a book called The Memory Tree. This book begins with the end of a life of the fox. Life of a fox. The book begins by telling the reader Fox has lived a long and happy life. But now he was very tired. Very slowly, Fox made his way to his favorite spot in, in the clearing. He looked at his beloved forest one last time and lay down. Fox closed his eye, took a deep breath, and fell asleep forever. Before long, Fox's friends started to gather in the, cl in the clearing. They sit together and tell stories for a, for a special mo moment. As, as they share with Fox, as they share their memories, a tree began to grow, becoming bigger and stronger with each memory. Sheltering and protecting all the animals in the forest like Fox did when he was alive. This book will be added to Ross Library in the, and will be there to help children who need comforting when a loved one passes away. We at North Hill School District also have many wonderful memories of Miss Arlene Bender. Miss Bender truly cared about the students of North Hill School District and showed the, this in the love and commitment she gave during the time of her North Hill School Board. We are blessed, blessed to have mi had Miss Bender as our advocate during her time on the board. Her memory will live on in the hearts and spirits of the people she worked with and the students who benefit, benefited from her deduction. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Ileana Aguilu. I'm a sixth grader and I'm student council president in Highcliff Elementary. I'm honored to be here tonight to present the book, The Pittsburgh Pirates Encyclopedia, by David Finoli and Bill Rainier, in recognition and appreciation of school board president, Mr. L, Mr. Ed Wilgus. Mm -hmm. Just like the Pittsburgh Pirates, Mr. Wilgus has weathered many storms as a school board member for the past 20 years. Mr. Wilgus is an avid baseball fan, so this book, The Pittsburgh Pirates Encyclopedia, is a is a great way to honor him and educate other baseball enthusiasts about the storied past of our hometown buckos. We wish you as much success and honor as the 1979 World Champion Pirates. Your commitment <laughs> and steadfast support of the North Hill School District is greatly appreciated. Thank you so very much, Mr. Wilgus, for all that you do for the North Hill School District. Thank you. I'm losing faith here. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Connor Galbraith from McIntyre Elementary. I am in fifth grade. I am here to present the book, The Cow Tripped Over the Moon. <coughs> oh God, that hurts. That hurts. To Mr. Michael Witherell for his dedication and time in North Hill School District. Mr. Witherell is a 1971 graduate, head of North Hill School District, and a lifelong resident. He has been the solicitor of North Hill School District since 1984. He's the owner of the law firm Witherell & Associates, which has been located in, in the North Hills for 27 years. He began practicing law in 1978 and currently represents school districts, Hicks Regional Municipal Entities, He's including in the municipalities and Pennsylvania Municipal Authorities Association. You may be familiar with the poem, The Cow Jumped Over the Moon, but that poem doesn't tell the whole story. This book, The Cow Tripped Over the Moon, explains that it took the cow many tries before she finally made it over her the moon. I like this book because it encourages perseverance and to keep trying because eventually you will succeed if you just keep trying at your problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> 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 
Hello, my name is Lily Hilligus, and I'm a fifth grader at McIntyre Elementary School. Tonight, I'm presenting the book, Hello, Hello, in honor of Miss Kathy Reed for de devotion, time, and support of the North Hill School District. Mrs. Reed has lived in the district for 40 years. Throughout her years here, she has served on the North Hill School Board for three years and is on the education per <coughs> personal and policy committees. Mrs. Reed retired from the district in 2007 after working as an activities coordinator for nine years. Prior to that, she worked for a judge. You probably think she's just here to make decisions and plans to improve the district, but Miss Reed is an avid and zealous North Hills fan. You may find her in attendance at games, band, or orchestra performances. She is also a preschool volunteer. One initiative innovate innovative in North Hills School District this year is the Sandy Hook Promise. This teaches us to make sure all students are included socially in our schools. No one is left out on the outside feeling lonely or depressed. This can lead to deeper problems which could impact school safety. Our first project this year, this year was Just Say Hello. At McIntyre, we have a huge post-it wall going up the main stairs to remind us all to just say hello. The book Hello, Hello shows animals of all different shapes, sizes, coloring, and ha habitats greeting each other. It all starts with a simple hello. The book Hello, Hello is in dedication in, is dedicated in honor of Miss Kathy Reed and will become part of the McIntyre Elementary School Library. Thank you. Hello, I'm Miley Yuri, and I'm here to, to present Mac Undercover by Mac, by Mac Barnett in honor of Mr. Thomas Kelly. This illustrated novel tells the story of Mac, a kid who lives in California with his mom during the 1980s. Mac is a pretty ordinary kid, except for the fact that he is a spy. In the first book in this new series, Mac gets a call from the Queen of the England, the crown jewels have been stolen, and of course this pre-team James Bond is the best person to help. Mr. Thomas Kelly isn't a spy, but he is someone we, kn we know we can count on when we need help. For, for almost 15 years, he has served on the North Hills School Board of Education, and we are very lucky to have him here, making this district a great place to learn and live. Thank you, Mr. Kelly, for all the wonderful work you <clears throat> do. Hi, I'm Haley Yuri, and I am here to present Quarterly Takes a Bow by Viola Davis in honor of our school board member Tim Burnett. This book is about Corduroy the teddy bear going to see his very first musical on stage. Somehow Corduroy get, gets away from his fre best friend Lisa and he, he found himself on stage in the middle of the show. Famous actress Viola Davis used ideas from her own life in the movies and on stage to write this new book about Kuroi, whose first book was made over 50 years ago. Mr. Tim Burnett has used ideas from his own life to help use to help us at North Hills. He has been on our school boards for many years, and he is always there to help make our school disc the best they can be. Mr. Burnett, please take a bow as we say thank you for all you do. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to Mr. I'd like to introduce you guys to Mr. Hillegas from the high school art department. Come on up, Mr. Hillegas. Everybody knows Mr. Hillegas. Oh, 
on behalf of the high school art department, first of all, that's a pretty tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, my students came tonight to show appreciation with a small gift of mugs that were personally designed by the digital design class at the high school and our pottery students. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, while they're passing out those mugs, uh, just to conclude, a special thank you to all of the school librarians for coordinating uh, this fantastic event again. Uh, this recognition program is always such a pleasure to me. I'm sure it is to all the other student presenters as well. Uh, we hope that it's just as good for you guys as it is for us. Learning about you is always extremely fun and interesting, and it's always great to know who's leading our school into the good place that it is now. Uh, We'd also like to thank Mr. Hillegas and the entire art department for the design of these mugs. Uh, the artwork is simply beautiful. I saw it before it was actually presented tonight. It looks fantastic. Uh, again, board members, thank you so much for your generous gift of time and service to North Hills. I can tell you from a student's perspective, we all sincerely appreciate it. You've Thanks. made uh, North Hills amazing. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to all the students who, who participated this evening with, with, the, with the books and the, and the mugs. Thank you all. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Wilkins, yes. if I may, I, oh, oh yeah, uh, I wanted to see if Mr. Hillegas was still here. A number of years ago, in fact, I don't know, I know Tim was on the board, but I was on the board, and you made, the kids made a, a coffee mug. And I still use that coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. It yeah. was great. Thank you. Yeah. Great. These are really yeah. nice. Thanks Thank you. Much. You just need to make them a little bit bigger. We drink more <laughs> coffee than those little ones. <laughs> just tell the students. <laughs> Good. Thank you all. Thanks Thank again. You. Thank you so much. <laughs> I mean, if he could convince Olivia's mom to take them home, he probably would. <laughs> okay, we can now move on to uh, board member comments. Are there any comments from the board this evening? Too busy reading my book. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to say for this group? Uh, really? <laughs> uh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> 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 Uh, we can now move on to public comments on the agenda items only. So if there's anybody that's signed up to address the board on the agenda items, you can uh, you can do that now. And Lori, we do have our, our notice up there for... The notice... Okay. Oh, the notice is up there, Okay, yes, so we don't actually, have to make we'll that announcement. Make sure okay. there. There are no uh, comments on the, on the agenda items? If you would be kind enough to state your name and address for the record, please, before you start. Thank you. Deanna Philpot, 29 Chapel Drive. Um, I have a question, not so much a comment. Um, it's about the budgets. So I don't know if we're able to answer it now, if it needs to wait for the budget section, or if it's going to need more research. But um, it's about the food service budget specifically. Surprise. <laughs> um, so the Food Research and Action Center reported this week that they're doing a lot of research into how the government shutdown is affecting school, school district uh, budgets and you know they're finding the USDA has said that all school districts are funded for their food service through March um, but the Food Research and Action, Action Center FRAC they've um, been finding that districts are already starting to worry and plan for what happens if the shutdown continues um, that there are districts already you know 
changing their menu to um, cut out fresh produce and more expensive items, um, or putting plans in place, like actively working on plans um, for what happens if it goes on. So I guess I have, so my questions are, um, oh, and they're saying that um, the districts across the country that are lucky have reserve funds in place to cover um, you know, situations like this. So I'm wondering if we have a reserve fund for food service, and if we do, how long it would take us um, through. And um, if we've already started making changes to our menu, if not, have we started planning in case this goes on past our reserve funds? Um, and if those discussions are happening, if there are any changes parents should expect to see on the menus? I can't answer all of those questions, but I sure. think we are in pretty good shape at least for the next few months. But I'll, I would be more than glad to get back and make sure that what I'm suggesting or saying is factually true. So I don't think we can answer that tonight, but we will answer that as soon as I get all the data. So Sounds good. All the, all the acts. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, she knows something I don't. Okay, good. <clears throat> all right. Uh, any other uh, public comments? Thank you. Thank okay. you. Oh, sure. Um, I'm Matt Ferry, 309 Highland Pines Drive. Um, I wanted to say that I'm in favor of moving the sixth grade to the middle school. I can't imagine there's any other remotely acceptable um, solution to the problem that we have. Um, there are a couple problems potentially with such a thing, and Dr. Manorino has kind of uh, alluded to those in the past, I think. But I wanted to mention a couple of them from the literature real quick. Um, when people have studied um, sixth grade in elementary school versus middle school, um, some studies find that there is no um, disproportionately large effect either way or that there is no lasting um, effect. Of course, when we change schools, um, there's a blip, but it goes away in many cases. Other studies have found uh, various problems, and I wanted to mention three of them real quick. Um, the first one um, looked primarily at students' behavior and the probability of having an infraction during the year and found that there was a... Um, significant increase among students with in sixth grade who were in a middle school setting uh, compared to elementary. And that is completely unsurprising. The important thing was that that effect was persistent, at least through ninth grade when they stopped following those students. Um, a second one found that there was a greater impact on academic performance um, with a K through five grade span compared to K through six and that that was disproportionately true for low socioeconomic status students. A third one um, found, looked at on-time graduation rates for students um, who either transitioned before or after sixth grade, and specifically they looked at a set of school districts that had just changed from the K through five to the K through six, and ones that had changed from K through six to K through five like we're proposing to do now. Um, in the the second case, the one like ours, they found a 3% reduction in on-time graduation. And when you flip it, there was a 2.3% increase in on-time graduation. Um, the, uh, the authors of that study noted that when you look at graduation rate, that's a measure generally of the impact on lower performing students. Higher performing students is the difference between a, a and a B maybe. Lower performing students could be pass or fail. So in at least a few cases, um, there are statistically significant and personally um, really substantial impacts of making that move earlier, so it's something to pay attention to. And I don't think that the board should get involved in the details of how we do that, but I do think it's important that you specify in policy what data you want to see in order to measure the impacts on students of this change. And an insufficiently granular look at those data I think could mask some problems where you have one population of students, probably, probably the ones who are lower performing now, um, that could be offset by a different population of students um, for whom some of these changes are actually beneficial. So I would encourage you to look back a couple years um, at data. Once you decide what it is exactly you want to look at, form a baseline, and then plan to monitor those data for probably 10 years out to make sure that we don't uh, miss the possible impact on students' behavior or academic performance. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for your comments. Appreciate it. Any other public comments on the agenda items? Thank you, both of you, for uh, pointing that out. And uh, we'll get back to you on the other stuff, Deanna. 
Uh, now we'll move on to the approval of the minutes, and this is uh, re with respect to the board. Approve the minutes. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes for the December 4th, 2018 reorganization meeting and December 4th, 2018 work, work session legislative meeting per the attached. I'll second. second it. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. Thank you. Is there anything from the solicitor this evening? No. Okay, thank you. Olaf, I think you're still on for the uh, uh, student representative report. Uh, I do not have anything pre-written, but I could give you a very short uh, run through of some stuff that I have on the, in my head. How about it? How about it? Okay. <laughs> so, you got 30 uh, seconds. Let's see. So, <laughs> Just kidding. Go um, so at the moment, I know the music uh, section of our school is preparing for their trip to New York. They've been fundraising for a couple months now. They still are. Uh, it's between 150 and I believe $200 payments uh, to fill the entire trip. Oh. Um, in addition, we're preparing for a curriculum night, which is next Wednesday night. Oh. Uh, that's from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, at the high school. Uh, basically, middle school students can go up during curriculum night and find out more about the classes that they want to enroll in beforehand. So if you're a middle school student coming up to the high school and you don't know what you're going to schedule yet, uh, it's a very beneficial evening to go to. They have a bunch of tables for clubs and such as well. Uh, I believe that's all that's really important that's going on right now, at least uh, super noteworthy. Uh, another really good thing is we've had two four days weeks in a row, and it's been <laughs> a really good time to get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's thank you. That's great. No, thank you. That's good stuff. Yeah, we appreciate that. Okay, uh, next we're going to ask Mr. Peter Van Cherry to, from Hozak Spec Mutual and Wood LLC our, uh, to, to go over our audited financial statements as of June 30th, 2018. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sure. And you can be sure this will not be as entertaining as <laughs> anything else was <laughs> earlier. Seconds. <laughs> Uh, we, we, we will go fast. I see you have a big agenda, so uh, but we'll try to touch on some of the points within the audit report itself. Uh, so I get my glasses back. Um, so our audit report, as uh, I believe you've received a copy of that, and also there's a summary report that I put together sort of to go through some of the highlights in there. Um, our report, our opinion letter is an unmodified opinion, states the financial statements are fairly presented in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, we performed the audit in accordance with generally accepted auditing standards and generally accepted government auditing standards. Uh, so we'll take, we're going to take a look at the, uh, basically the fund financial statements for the school district. Uh, so you have a couple governmental funds. The first fund we want to look at is your general fund. Uh, so the balance sheet of your general fund uh, shows your fund balance uh, as a 63018 broken into three categories, non-spendable, assigned, and unassigned. So as you can see, the unassigned fund balance of $6,036,815 at the end of the year. Uh, that's approximately 7.6% of your budgeted expenditures uh, as of the end of the year. Uh, the other fund you have is a capital project fund. Uh, the fund balance in there at the end of the year is $3.5 million. Uh, those funds are committed, obviously, for future capital projects or capital purchases. Uh, and then there's a small debt service fund, which has a balance of $165,000 at the end of the year. Uh, for the general fund, looking at the revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance, uh, your total revenues for the year were $78 million, uh, expenditures $76 million, and then other financing sources and uses. The majority of that would, would have been transfers to the capital project fund during the year. So your change in fund balance for 17-18 fiscal year uh, was a positive $177,000 uh, compared to what you anticipated when you prepared your budget for 17-18. Uh, the budget reflected that you would use approximately about $1.3 million of your fund balance to balance the budget. So where those variances came in at as to where you were uh, different from your budget, uh, the revenues came in over budget $272,000. Uh, as you can see, that's less than 1%, 0.35%. Uh, so that overall, I mean, I don't know if you can get much closer on an $80 million budget than, than what you did on that side. So that sort of, sort of uh, shows that the budget's a realistic budget, uh, and you're maintaining that on, on the same side of it as you go through the year. Uh, then on the expenditures, the expenditures came in under budget, a million, just a little bit over a million dollars. There again, when you compare that on a percentage basis to the $80 million budget, you're at 1.3%. So 
So looking at your revenues and breaking them down into the different categories of local, state, and federal, uh, you can see the numbers there and the percentage. As expected, the majority of your revenues are coming from local sources, 74.6%. And of that local sources, real estate taxes uh, represent about 80% of those taxes that come in from local sources. Um, so then your expenditures are broken into those different functions there. Instruction, support, which are the largest one, that comprises about 87% of your budget. Uh, then the next largest expenditure would be debt service. Uh, so the payments you're making on your outstanding bonds and notes, uh, that's a 10% of your total budget. So the next fund would be the capital project fund. Uh, that's a fund that uh, the school district uses to uh, fund various projects throughout the year from funds that have been set aside from general fund revenues. Uh, total revenues or total expenditures in the year were $2.5 million. As I stated earlier, the general fund transferred $1,020,000 over to that fund uh, to help fund current projects in future. Uh, and then the other uh, sale of capital assets, that $445,000, that was the proceeds that you received from the sale of uh, uh, the Seville School. Uh, you, if you look in the financial statements, there's also a footnote in there that describes uh, the receivable that on the sales agreement that that payment will be made over a period of time. So in that fund shows the, the total sale, but it also has a receivable for the funds that will be coming in during the year. The last fund will be your debt service fund. Uh, revenues in there are $82,000. That's funds that you're receiving from your uh, derivative instrument. You do still have one uh, swap agreement out there uh, that does provide some additional funds uh, in 17-18 that was about $82,000 from that transaction. Uh, one of the other funds that's not a governmental fund, it's a proprietary type fund, is your food service fund. Uh, as you can see the change in net position for the year, uh, excluding any adjustments for the pension liability, uh, were, it was a positive $180,000. So the revenues exceeded the expenditures uh, by that amount, now that would just be the direct expenditures of that fund. So that would be salaries, benefits, uh, supplies, and, and various other items like that, not, not including any indirect cost, such as electricity, utilities, those types of items. But as you can see, that's comparable to the prior year. Uh, excess was about $172,000. Okay. Uh, the next section would be the footnotes. Uh, they go on for about 50 pages, so we won't get into the details of all those. But just to point out a couple of uh, items within uh, the footnotes there. Uh, we spoke in prior years of the net pension liability that's on your financial statements, at least on the government-wide financial statements. That's your proportionate share of PISER's net pension liability. Uh, so basically how it's calculated is it takes the contributions you make into PISER's as North Hill School District and compares that to the total contributions of all members uh, in that in that cost-sharing plan. So and it calculates then the total pension liability, uh, net pension liability, and, and times that percentage. So your share of that liability then is 63018 is $126,632,000. Within the financial statements themselves, there's required supplementary information in there that shows what your contributions to PISERS were over the last four years, shows the liability, shows the percentage of assets to the liability and some other significant data in the financial statements that support some of those numbers. Uh, one other item in the notes, uh, long-term debt. So your debt, uh, your general obligation bonds outstanding at the end of the year, the principal amount, just a little over $58 million. Uh, you had retired principal, uh, paying down the principal on the bonds in 17-18 of $5,090,000. Uh, the other debt you have is uh, some general obligation notes. Uh, they're related to the uh, uh, renovations that were done at A.W. Beatty uh, about three or four years ago, or actually more than that. Uh, so that sitting balance on that's $1,880,000, uh, uh, and you pay down 131000 on that. A couple other notes just to point out. We uh, mentioned the derivative financial instruments. So there's disclosures in there. talks about that instrument, what the fair value of that instrument is, and, the, and, and how that transaction's uh, recorded in the statements. Then there's also a, a footnote on the post-employment benefits. Uh, this was a new statement that was implemented last year. So that shows what the actuarial cost of post-employment benefits that you provide under your various terms of contracts, what that estimated actuarial liability is uh, as of the end of the year. Uh, and that number is about $3.1 million. So that's benefits that are currently being provided to employees under contracts. 
Uh, the last section in your financial statements is the single audit section. Uh, this section is required because the district does expend over $750,000 in federal awards uh, during the year. So we are required to do some additional testing and perform and prepare additional reports related to those funds. Uh, the summary of the audit results ref are reflected on page 78 in the statements. Uh, and basically it shows that there was no material instances of uh, noncompliance related to the program that we tested. Uh, and the program we tested was the child nutrition cluster or the school lunch, school breakfast program. So there was no material weaknesses in controls or over compliance with that program. And then that is the total federal awards uh, that were expended in 1718, the $2,017,190. So now very quickly is a quick summary of the financial statements for the year at 63018. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions or uh, if there's none now, we can definitely get them answered later on if, we, if you have a, have a question. I have, I have a, I'm just curious about this. You had mentioned that 80% of the local revenue was from real estate. Is that pretty standard in this um, region? Uh, in Like the Allegheny County? Yes. Well, it depends what area of the okay. Allegheny County you're in. So it does fluctuate greatly. Um, you know, some school districts in Allegheny County, their state revenues might be equal to percentage wise to their local revenues. I meant uh, the, the, is it norm? I mean, is, is 80% from real estate as a proportion of the local? Yeah, revenue? it would that's, be. Because the, okay. yeah, the other taxes would be the other next largest tax okay. would be earned income tax and then transfer sure. tax probably. Okay. So all right. Thanks yeah. very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I, I just want to say, I, uh, from my perspective, uh, these I know these numbers start to create almost a blur when you look at these things, but this, this financial statement, comparatively speaking to our, our neighboring school districts and in the area, uh, are really, this, these are pretty stellar numbers. Uh, our, our financials are, uh, are a testament to the administration <coughs> and how we watch every dollar to this board, obviously, to make sure that we approve uh, expenditures that are in line with what we think and um, uh, also taking care or trying to take care of the taxpayer we're like the fifth I think this fifth or fourth or somewhere in that area lowest millage rate in in the area uh, so we are very careful how we uh, how we treat those kinds of things uh, I want to again say thank you to Jerry and I know Dave all isn't here but I know you do a lot of work on this stuff and and we're in the middle of crunching a budget coming out and believe me it's it's not easy to to do these things uh, and and make things balance and and still make the needs of the district that that are necessary to educate our children because that comes first but it's a it's a difficult job but I was if you look at what we have in the way of fund balances our, our debt uh, that is is uh, I consider to be uh, not minimal but it's much lower than a lot of places our fund balance like I said is in great shape uh, uh, we did a lot of improvements to the district that we paid cash for. We didn't go out and borrow money over the years. So all that being said, I think it's just really a, a testament to uh, the way we've managed our financials. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, you know, there's, these are pretty, it's a pretty good report. Uh, we don't have any, uh, we don't have any audit exceptions. Am I correct? Correct, so, yes. I mean, that's correct. Yes, no material yeah, weaknesses business. and controls yeah. and no non-compliance issues, correct. So all that being said, that uh, again, I, like I said, when you get into numbers, it kind of gets a little bit b blurry, but <laughs> I, I think it's an excellent report, and I just want to again congratulate uh, this board for the way we've handled this and the, and the administration and, uh, and of course, the constituents who come out and, and, and do their fair share to tell us, because we do have public budget meetings, and they kind of add their, their two cents to the thing, and we certainly take all that very seriously. So, uh, again, I, I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a good situation. As I said, I'm comfortable with our fund balance. Would, we wish there would be more. Uh, the only thing that kind of really is difficult to deal with, and there's, that came down from our friends at the state level, is the, is the retirement program. And there's, there's a lot of money. It's, what was it $160 million that we're... Your um, liability is 126 million. 126 yeah, the total million. liability is 45 that's, billion dollars. So that's incredible. Uh, it's just inc and it's just it's just inc uh, I'll, uh, I'll get crazy on it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so that being said, I just wanted to make those comments. So if anybody else okay. has any any other thoughts? Peter, thank you. Well, thank and we'll, if we have anything else, we'll certainly get a hold of you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, so you. Thank you very much for allowing thanks. us to work for the district too. We uh, thank you. continue Absolutely. to continue yeah, that relationship. We appreciate your efforts. Thanks. Absolutely. Okay, now we will move on to the superintendent's report. Dr. Manorino. I'm just going to stay up here and do the uh, points of pride, and then I'll do the uh, sixth grade presentation, too, while I'm up here. So we'll just take care of both of those items. So Jeff, as soon as you get that points of pride up there. There we go. 
Okay, so this is the points of pride for the month of December. So it's pretty lengthy because there's a lot of really good things that happen in this district um, in the month of December, and a lot of the giving projects occur in December that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so the first one is the Ross Elementary sixth graders race chariots of their own design as a part of the Combined Computer Science and Social Studies activity as a part of their Ancient Civilizations unit. Seventh grader Dalton Billiter won the middle school's Geography B. He will now take a written exam to determine if he moves on to the state Geography B. Six high school students passed the 1.1 vertical open root weld. Oh, I wish Dem Harder was here and explained that one. How about that, Mr. Hosa? Each student is now eligible for nine college credits at CCAC, through the which is the only high school partnership of its kind in this area. So we're doing some really impressive things in that welding group to have students in the high school passing that level of certification is really impressive. 17 high school students took top honors at the regional competition of the Future Business Leaders of America, and they advanced to the state competition in April. Six of our students won first place in their events. The A.W. Beatty Career Center seniors Armand Crippen and David Uhl earned third place in the Greater Pittsburgh Auto Dealer CCAC competition. Armand was also recognized as a member of one of the state's top ten automotive teams in the Pennsylvania Automotive Association competition. Elementary band students performed holiday favorites during the special performance of, at the block at Northway, and they raised hundreds of dollars for the district's Elves Fund, which supports North Hills families during the holiday season, and they also accepted food donations for North Hills Cares. The high school and middle school art departments featured student work at their third annual North Hills Center Art Show this month. Ross Elementary fifth grader Allie Jusky? Gusky? There you go. A dog-inspired drawing of one of 13 winners in the statewide Pennsylvania Attorney General's Drug-Free Calendar Contest. Allie is one of 912 students from 140 schools across the state who drafted original artwork illustrating a drug-free message. It's going to be supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. The North Hills Drama Club will present its winter musical, Mary Poppins Jr., on January 31st to February 2nd at 7 p.m. in the North Hills Middle School. All tickets will be reserved seatings, and ticket sale information is available on the district's website. The competitive spirit team advanced to the National High School Cheerleading Championship in Orlando, where they will compete in game day super varsity and super varsity non-tumbling divisions. The team also qualified and competed in the PIAA championships last week. Congratulations, Tyler, who's in attendance tonight. Congratulations to Tyler and uh, to Lirio Mertesi. Tyler Brenner will be attending the United States Military Academy, and uh, Lirio Mertesi will be attending the United States Naval Academy, and they will be continuing their athletic and their academic pursuits. So, Tyler, we wish you the best of luck, and, and same to Lirio. Congratulations. Alarm yet, Tyler? Hilltop Heroes Club transformed the high school into Harry Potter themed castle, welcomed 460 attendees for their return to Hogwarts event, and they raised nearly $2,500 to support CSA of Allegheny County. This was the 30th annual funds uh, for the Elves, and the staff members contributed a record high $4,082 to the Elves Fund, and this fund provides a little extra help during the holiday season to more than 100 North Hill School District families. The annual charitable Charitable Tradition celebrated its 30th anniversary this year. High school SAD club students visited every elementary school to speak with every sixth grader about peer pressure and to suggest simple ways to avoid it. So fabulous club members at the high school made sensory bean bags and t-shirt bibs and donated them to the Watson Institute for Special Needs Students. North Hill students partnered with North Allegheny students to deliver 7,515 letters to Santa to Macy's on National Believe Day. On that day, Macy's doubles their annual $1 donation letter to $2 per be to benefit Make-A-Wish, so the letters resulted in $15,030 in donations. Highcliffe Elementary first graders and fifth graders teamed up to craft more than 40 blankets for Project Linus. These blankets provide love and a sense of security warmth and comfort to children battling serious illnesses. 
McIntyre Elementary Kindergarten students in Maria Hustler's class packed 23 gift bags and donated stuffed animals and books for the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Westview Elementary Student Council conducted a holiday food drive and collected more than 1,500 items to provide Westview families with boxes of food items for their holiday season. Ross Elementary third graders in Rebecca Dunham's class completed 20 days of giving. Their service projects included bookmarks for local libraries, placemats for Meals on Wheels, holiday letters to U.S. troops, cards and paper flowers for all 197 residents at Kane Community Center, and fleece blankets for Project Linus. Our middle school service club members brightened the holidays for, to, with visits to residents at Vincentian Home. During their visits, students made a craft, played bingo, sang songs, and surprised everyone with stockings full of gifts. Kindergarten registration for the 1920 school year will be held on February 18th. Please make your registration appointments as soon as possible. More information is available on our website under the quick links. Parents of incoming kindergarten students are invited to a special parent forum on January 30th at 7 p.m. at McIntyre Elementary. Here you can learn about our kindergarten curriculum, ask questions, and receive your kindergarten readiness bag. And those are our points of pride, tradition, and excellence for the month of December. You still have the floor. All right. You guys want to talk about sixth grade? <laughs> Where? Right there. Okay, um, where on the website is the white paper? Do you, what link? Okay, so I, I think it's under the parents link, we'll, but we'll put it out um, tomorrow as to where there's a white paper that goes along with this presentation. So there's a 24-page paper that goes along with the details of tonight's presentation. So we're not going to go through the details of those 24 pages, and if you can't sleep tonight, I would encourage you to read it. <laughs> but I am going to talk about the idea of moving sixth grade to the middle school, when we're going to uh, plan to do that. I, I just I found it on the website. Okay. It is under parents. If you scroll to the bottom, it, there's elementary student population solutions. Okay. And that's where the information is. Got it. It's under the parents link. Okay. So that's the re that's the full report of everything that's kind of in here in a more condensed version, um, for lack of a better term. But this is the analysis and the report that goes along with that plan. And I'm not going to begin with all the charts of numbers. Let's just cut right to the chase. This is a capacity issue. We're running out of capacity in three of our four elementary schools. And whenever I presented earlier in the year, that's the focus that I had talked about. And we talked about what were some of our options and what could we do. And it, it really comes down to, to moving sixth grade to the building in which there's room for them. And that's what a lot of tonight is going to talk about. So. In 1920, when we moved students to the next grade level, and having no idea what we have for kindergarten, but assuming large kindergarten, so what I did for kindergarten for next year is we, we budgeted four at Highcliffe, five at Ross, five at McIntyre, four at Westview. That's what the trend has been for quite some time. Yes, we've had some outliers. I think there's five in kindergarten, five kindergartens at Highcliffe this year. So yes, there are outliers to that number. There are six kindergartens at McIntyre. Okay, but we budgeted for 4554, five, four, which is over the last seven years the average of what that usually comes out to be. So that's what kindergarten looks like without knowing what kindergarten truly is bringing for us, and then moving every kid up a grade level. And so when we do that, because of our class size policy that has 23 students in K and 1, and 25 students in 2 and 3, and, 25, and 27 students in grades 4, 5, 6, we actually reduce sections slightly. So out of the gate, we're running 114 sections in the elementary school this year. Early projection, nobody moves into the district. We started 111. Now, again, the slides that I've showed you a number of times show you that that's not going to be the case this summer, and I don't believe it's going to be the case either. So we're planning for those numbers to be larger, but it's really based upon which building grows is where the problem lies. Okay, so right now, when you move to next year, Highcliffe is going to have 27 sections. They have 29 classrooms, so there's two available. There's room. 
Okay, so this is where I said in December, it's not crisis right now. I'm not coming to the board saying, I don't know what we're going to do. We've got to move and do this now. No, that's not it. The last slide is going to tell you I'm recommending this for 2021. Because we can have some contingency plans next year in the event we would get this mass influx of students to Highcliffe, and now I've got to add three sections. What do I do? So we have some plans, and our board policy allows us to, after June 1st, move students to a different district. So students are different not district, different building. <laughs> that was good. So if a student moves into the district after June 1st, and let's just use Highcliffe just because I'm looking at Sherry Kovach, and that's why I keep saying Highcliffe. So let's just say at Highcliffe we're out of rooms, and we have a student move into a grade that's closed, they would go to Westview, and we would transport them. And so that's how the contingency plan works. We've got 121 elementary classrooms. I'm pretty sure we're not going to get that big over the summer. Okay, so there's room to maneuver within the numbers without having to do this now. But we are running out of space at Highcliffe and at Ross. And it even says that next year when we move them up. Okay, so that's what that would look like. And so that's where it says um, our projections are going to show an increase through 2025. And I've talked about what our projections look like. And, and they're off at this point. But the part that's not off is it says that we are going to continue to grow. And so we have to look for a plan that we can sustain this growth model through 2025. And that's really what this idea is looking for. Okay? We traditionally have about 45 students, and it says it right there. It doesn't account for them, but there's room for them. Okay? So that's what those last bullets are talking about. Okay, so if we move in sixth grade to the middle school, this is going to reconfigure our buildings into K5, 6, 8, 9 through 12. It creates elementary capacity relief to handle that projected increase that I was just talking about. And it basically gains four classrooms in every one of our buildings. That's four in addition to the ones that are currently available. So they're high, Westview at this point, when you move them up next year, is running 24 of 28. You remove sixth grade, you're running 20 of 28 at Westview. Okay, so Highcliff is running... 27 of 29. You move four out, you're 23 of 29. You've created a significant amount of capacity in each of those buildings that hopefully we can sustain this growth model, as I said, projected through 2025. So this becomes possible because we closed this campus. Last year with the safety initiative, we had real language in this wing right here. There's 12 classrooms in this wing. 100% of those classes are now scheduled within the high school. There's no movement between the two buildings. So we have literally vacated 12 classrooms out of this building. That's how this becomes possible. Okay, so that's the first step in the process. Had we not done that, and, and I said that the last time we redistricted, is that that wasn't a possibility unless we moved real language. And we weren't intending to do that. Well, times changed. Different parameters in the way education safety looks now changed. So we're closed in this campus, and now we have 12 vacant rooms because of that closure. So what happens here, when you're talking about building capacities, and I didn't know this until I dug up the plan con documents, but this is the largest building in the district. It's bigger than the high school across the street. And it runs at 39% efficiency, and we have three elementary schools running at 98 and one of them's at 99. Okay, so it's not just the 12 rooms that were vacated by the world language move, but there's additional space here in the classroom configuration of this building that allows us to move all of the rooms that we would need for K-6 education, plus the special areas and the other things that we would do for them with special education and gifted education, music, art, STEM, all of those things, there's space for because of the number of classrooms that this building has in it. Okay, so there's the 12 vacated. Sixth grade is going to require 16 classrooms, and I'm going to explain that here in a minute. But we need 16 classrooms. That's for the, the sixth grade educational operations of English, math, science, and social studies. Okay, so I need 16 rooms there plus special rooms. Okay, and then space for special area classes is also available. So there's room here when we do these configurations. Okay, so this is talking about that school within a school model, and what does that mean? So we run a middle school for 7th and 8th grade. On team concept, 40-minute periods. It does not work for 6th grade. It does not work moving them here. In a lot of the study, without reading Mr. Ferry's study, 
That's where those problems lie in. When you put those sixth grade students in the middle school environment is a lot of where those issues can take place. This is keeping the elementary model intact, which means that it's going to look just like it does at the elementary schools. It's just located in a different building. So their day is primarily going to be the same. I'm going to explain the differences and all the differences except for recess is positive. Okay, so the first thing that we did, or one of the things that we did this year is we departmentalized. So basically you have teachers working in pairs. If my strength is English and social studies, and my partner's strength is math and science, that's how we're going to do the scheduling. Same thing works in this environment. So we'll take two classrooms of students with two teachers. One teacher will be the math and science teacher. The other teacher will be the English and social studies teacher, and they will share that group of 50 or so students. So that piece is going to stay, which really is a nice transition from elementary school to middle school as we're kind of getting them through that process. That's going to stay, which means we need to have an even number. And I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit. But that's why the number 16 is so important in this model. Because of this departmentalization of teachers, I need an even number. Okay. So currently, um, we run English as a double period. It's about 80 minutes at 6th grade. Math is 80 minutes at 6th grade. Science and social studies are 40 minutes in 6th grade. Works perfect. We run a 9 period day in this middle school, 40 minute periods. So you double up math, 2 periods, that's 80. English, 2 periods, that's 80. 1 period for social studies, 1 period for science. Now we've got lunch and 2 spaces for specials. And that's where we'd be able to gain uh, better education, I guess, for the sixth grade students. That's what this is talking about. What does that six-day cycle look like here? It doesn't. So the six-day cycle works in the elementary school because of the way that cycle is broken apart. You get every one of those specials 30 days over the 100-day period, 180-day uh, period. You get phys ed twice, so that's 60 in that 180-day period. We're going to kind of blend this into the trimester model that we use at the middle school. And by doing that, they gain more time in their special areas. And it looks like this. So these, in a trimester, the courses meet every day for 60 days. So it's not once every six days. So when I have art, I go to art today and tomorrow and every day for 60 days. It allows me to focus on the project that I'm working on and get immersed into that activity and what we're doing. So the way this is going to work here is... Um, you're going to have music, or you're going to have computer science, art, and STEM in your trimester. So that will be one period. And it leaves the other period for band and physical education. And so in sixth grade, we have a general music class that meets 30 times in that cycle. And then we have instrumental music that meets about 60 times because it meets twice in the six-day cycle. So traditionally, the instrumental, either orchestra or instrument student, and the general music student get 90 periods of music. We're going to run it as an AB block here, which means on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you'll do general music and either instrument, orchestra, or vocal music. And then Tuesday and Thursday, you'll get phys ed. And when you break that out, it turns into 108 classes of music as opposed to 90, and 72 classes of phys ed as opposed to 60. So each of these special areas increase in the amount of time our sixth grade students have access to this. Okay? And I said the first time we did this, this is not a free move. Okay? There's a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of additional parts to this. And again, in the document that's under the parents link, it gets into much greater detail about each of these and what they look like. But this is what's going to require from us to add to this to move 6th grade to the middle school. Those in red, we already own them. That's not an ad. We have 16 6th grade teachers. I need 16 6th grade teachers. That's not an ad. It's the same group. Okay, but what we need is, if we're going to add 350 to 400 students to this building, it's going to require an assistant principal. And that assistant principal is going to require a secretary, and that's here at the bottom. I think we need to add a guidance counselor, so we added a guidance counselor, so that the, and we had talked about the, the guidance counselors would rotate, so that if this year I have the sixth graders, I stay with them for three years. Okay, so we would have a sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade guidance counselor, but they would be with the same group of kids as those kids grew up through the system. And then when those eighth graders went to the high school, then 
I would get the new sixth grade group coming in. That's how that transition would work. Um, we're going to need an art, music, computer science teacher because the, the load here is full for those teachers you can't add to it. And we're not taking enough from the elementary schools to pull one of those teachers with it. So it's going to require an additional teacher to run those sections at the middle school. Um, same thing with gifted education. Same, same thing. Uh, we're going to be pulling a number of gifted education teachers into this building that this gifted program can't not absorb as it is and we're not taking enough from the elementary schools to then take a gifted teacher, so that's an ad. So those are the examples of the ads. Um, this building does not have an autistic support but when we, uh, center, but when we look at that autistic support center when we created it at Ross, those students that we created it for are now exiting Ross and coming to the middle school, and this is something that I think is really needed here anyways, and this gives us a perfect opportunity to create that autistic support center in this building as those students grow up with us. And the same thing then is true for the learning support and emotional support students. We're not pulling enough students to be able to pull that relief from the elementary schools. We need to add it. Okay, so when you break this down, there are significant adds to this project. So this is not free. Okay, one of the things that I looked at was transportation. And I looked at six, five different models. Option six is keep it the same. Five different models on how we can redo a lot of different things. And um, I'm just telling you right now, I'm recommending keeping it the same for a number of reasons. And you can, again, read into that. But the complexity of the grade configuration and the time structures required is going to create a significant additional cost to this project. So it's going to be one thing for us to afford what the staffing model is going to look like. For us to also afford the transportation model is going to be on what we could do with a full tax increase. And I'm going to get to those numbers in a minute, too. But by keeping the time structures the same, I'll take questions at the end. By keeping time structures the same, it's going to limit the changes that are related to transition district-wide. The only way to make changes is to change everything. And so that would make changes from K through 12 to make any of these models work. Some of them are as little as 120000 and as much as 760000 additional to the budget. And again, those details are in that, that white paper. But I'll kind of explain some of those here in a minute. So I'm recommending that we keep the time structures the same, which keeps the busing structure the same, which does not add additional costs to this project in 2021. So the staffing model, when you put it all together, salary and benefits with the positions that we added is about $835,000. That's a significant chunk of that millage rate that we can raise to 1.6 or 7, uh, 1.07 million. And it's not a one-time dollar. It's personnel. So it grows every year. So it's not a 830000 and we're good to go. It's 830000 that's going to be added to the general budget and will be continued to be carried throughout, which is why it's hard to look at different timing reconfigurations that require us to add buses. And then to add buses, the price escalates from there as well. So every bus we add is $60,200. And so you can see how that can add up very, very quickly. Again, 24 pages of very detailed information are waiting for you at home on the internet. And so my recommendation is for us to do this in 2021. I think we have contingency plans in place that will allow us to absorb even summer move-ins. And then that also allows us to do the exit of elementary school right for our current fourth and fifth graders, as those fifth graders will also be exiting with the sixth graders you know, the following year. We can do a track and field event specifically for both groups, not combined, separate for both groups, have their own activity day. Um, we can involve them in things like the safety patrol leaders, involve them in the field trips and the middle school orientations, bring them to the play, like we have a group of students going next week to come and see Mary Poppins. Those things that allows them to get a glimpse of the middle school, do that for both groups next year. Um, and then they each get their own graduation day. So that, those are the really minor pieces of, of that, but it's, it's, those events are important. And so we want to make them important for both next year's sixth and fifth graders as they're both going to be exiting elementary school to the middle school. Okay? This plan, by moving it, allows us plan, time to, to plan for this, transition with it, and really get it right whenever we get to that point. And there's my questions. Go ahead, ma'am. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. If you're going to keep 
numbers are going to increase in our buses at capacity. Well, sure. We add buses every year whenever we redo the transportation model based on the number of students we're transporting. But what I'm saying is that that would be in addition to what we would have to do just from natural growth. So I'm not saying we run 32 buses now. It's going to be 32 to the end. When we reconfigure, and you're right, we have much more elementary students, and I think that's shown in every chart that I've shown. So when we go do that transportation model, if it's that, okay, we're running 32 buses this year, but that doesn't work. We've got to run this at 34 buses. We're going to run it at 34 buses. But it's the change of time structure that then redoes a lot of the different routings uh, of the way the buses run and how we share routes with buses is where the numbers escalate uh, by adding buses on top of what we would add just for normal growth. Well, we're from Wallingford, and so we get Wallingford and Berkeley, and that's one bus in itself. And if you're gonna, if, if it's gonna continue to grow, you're not gonna fit any more people on that bus. I mean, you're simply not. We're, we're there, they're crammed as they are now. I mean, so I understand that cost and time is another issue, but the fact that the seventh and eighth graders have to sit free to a seat, that's an issue. With instruments, with sports equipment, with, and even the fifth and sixth graders, with their, with their, with their, their, their force sit free to a seat. So that's an issue. I mean, and, and it's been, obviously in our neighborhood, it doesn't seem that there's, there, we have little ones in our neighborhood right now that we have a couple in kindergarten coming up, but I don't know about Brookmead and the other, and the other things, but I don't know about the other neighborhoods in the area either. So, I mean, just to so let you know where we're coming from, so they're as crammed as they are sure. right now. Any other questions? Yeah. Two questions. Sure. Um, first question would be about the gifted program. Would you see that having a similar model to what we do in elementary or the seventh grade where it's kind of more of a you know, loose when the kids have time they do projects? I haven't really sat down with Mrs. Bazilla, but I want to say more like the sixth grade model. That's part of the school within the school idea. Um, so more like the sixth grade model, but more of the transition to seventh grade as well. So we could use it as that springboard from elementary to middle school. But the whole idea is to keep this as much like sixth grade as it looks now. Because we're successful in the things that we're doing in all of those programs, including the gifted program. So the, the, the intent and the goal is to keep it much like it is now. And then my other question was regarding lunch. Where I know the seventh graders yeah. are forced to sit with their routine when they first start. I know my son personally, I'm not really in favor of that. It yeah. meant breaking up friends and um, you know, you're trying to meet new people, but um, maybe not the most natural way to do that sometimes. Would you see the sixth graders being forced to sit with? We haven't even talked about that as a detail, but um, sixth grade will have their own lunch, just sixth grade, sixth grade only. So you know, there's a number of ways they could manage the students in that lunchroom. Sit boy, girl, like we used to. <laughs> <laughs> yes. With sixth grade, um, I have three in high class now, and I don't have any in the middle school yet. Um, but I have a daughter that will be coming up next year, and then one will be affected. She's now a fourth grader, so she would be affected by this. So I don't know if the middle school right now, if the seventh and eighth graders um, sort of interact with each other a lot, would the sixth graders also interact with the Not so much. So the way this building is kind of laid out, sixth grade will be in one location and it'll be operated kind of as itself. So the only time the students leave that area is when they would have to go to lunch, which they're all going to be going together anyways. Um, but then art, music, phys ed, STEM, those are all down the main hallway into the basement by the cafeteria along that back wall. So it's literally down the set of steps that's right there is based upon where they're going to be located. So they're going to be some pretty much isolated, but there's not going to be that bell rings now at second period, all the students go, go to the room you're supposed to go to. It's, it's going to be more of a structured environment like it is at the elementary school. Because if, if you and I are partners in teaching, our rooms are going to be right beside each other. So my kids are going to go to your room because it's time for their English, and your kids are going to come to my room because it's their time for their math. So it's literally going to be in that self-contained area until they go to those special classes, which is twice, and lunch, which is once. And at that point, we escort them now. We haven't really talked about whether we're going to escort them through this building or not, but that is not out of the realm of possibilities, that our sixth grade teachers escort them to the gym, escort them back like they do now at the elementary school. So that's how this model is going to work. So they're not bell rings, and it's, um, it's open like it is now. Does that make sense? Yeah. And this, so this is... Um 
I can't think of any other way for us to create capacity without building a building, and if we do, it's not going to be done for the 2021 school year, and it's much more than 800,000. That's it's a capacity issue, and and that's really what it is. And I, I even said this from the beginning. Um, I don't necessarily love the model of us doing this. It's something that I've kind of tried to protect us from since I've been superintendent for eight years. But I'm out of options, and we're out of space at three elementaries, and I've got a building running at 40% capacity right here, and so it's almost like it's the direction it's being pushed. Um, not by anybody, it's not the board said do it or, you know, but that's what it begins to look like is the right solution for the problem that we have, and it's a great problem. We're growing. People want our product, and that's really nice to have, and we're doing great things which is attracting students, um, but it's attracting students to the point where elementary capacity can't handle it, and we've got a middle school building running 40%. There's room, there's space, and we can run that program here with some additions that are really good. This is one of my favorite slides because academically it does a lot for kids with art, music, STEM, which they STEM is not something that they do now. We can dedicate 60 days in a, in a school year for sixth graders to get a STEM education piece, a maker space, Lego building, you know pre-engineering type ideas for them that they don't get in the, in the school day that they have now. Um, double up art and music, that's great. You know, so that's what I see as the greatest benefit to this is that slide. I think there was somebody over here. Uh, no? Okay. I have a, a quick question. Um, I'm forward thinking because I've been through this twice now. Um, what is the capacity level at the high school? I forget what that model said. It's one classroom less than this one, so it's like 6, 1,640 something or other. But okay, it, it, when, I, when, I, when I project this yeah. out, you take those four classes yeah. now and you move them up, and if we're running at about 400, <coughs> this is what's going to happen again. So the difference is, is they're not scheduled in one little block that they all have to be in one room at the same time. When you get them over to the high school and it's a nine period open day, it, it moves much, much different and although it says the capacity is 16 something, it's with 20 students in a classroom. So are we gonna jump so that bridge when we get there? We don't need to, it's big enough. Okay. It's handled much, much bigger. And it handled much bigger when it had less rooms. Whenever we rebuilt the, or had the renovation project, we took spaces that were not academic classroom spaces and turned them into academic classroom spaces. For example, the TV studio, was a room off the side of the library. It's now the middle of the rotunda. The middle of the rotunda was a storage area before the construction project. So there's about five spaces in there that before renovation were not used for students. Now they are. So it's actually bigger than it was when it held more people. Okay, I was just forward thinking, yeah. like, yeah. what do we have next? I did that too. <laughs> because, uh, I dug out those documents as well. <laughs> They, they're going to get pulled during one of the eight periods available is what's going to happen. Right. Yeah, it's going to be more of a support period. Okay, so... There's a try period at the elementary school that all the pullouts happen in and no new instruction can happen in that pullout period. It, it, it doesn't exist in this model, so that's going to have to come out of either the special areas that grew or out of, um, out of the academic time. So, because we had talked about, do we put a study hall in here? No. It, it's, it's not the best use of academic time. But there's ways that we can create the support systems so that those supports are still available to students without becoming detrimental to the English, Math, Science, and Social Studies part that is what the support's there for them. Okay. A lot of the instrument, instrumental music comes out of that, and so, but that's where, that's where there's, there's two periods beyond that lunch period that become available. Yes. Yeah. They all, we also have a homeroom enrichment period here at the middle school. That will still exist in this time structure. 
Okay, so you run a non-period day, then there's that homeroom period at the end of the day, I think it's 30 minutes, right? So there's 30 minutes every day that's gonna be available to us for that enrichment type activity. Um, so that's another place that we can make sure that students are getting that support or getting the gifted education part of this. So every day, 30 minutes at the end of the day, is like an activity club homeroom enrichment period across the building. That exists in this model for them as well. Yes? I have three questions. Um, the first one is saying, so this, the PE structure yeah. is amazing. I mean, that's gold standards across Pennsylvania for the kids to have it two times a week all year. That's incredible. Um, my son's an actor, so I don't know this. So is this what the seventh and eighth graders have too? Or is this yes. what you so the, the entire middle school has PE twice a week? This is seventh grade. Then eighth grade, we add some electives that they can then choose from, and sometimes in that choice, they lose phys ed, but those that choose phys ed get it five days a week for a semester. Okay. Um, my other question is recess. So the sixth graders are losing recess because of lack of time or lack of a playground? Playground. I'm not building a playground here. <laughs> but I took that 30 minutes and I redistributed it into these types of academic pieces. No, we're not. Okay. No. And this, this goes back to the financial statement that we just read. Mm -hmm. I can do all of this for you. Let's just keep writing the check. We're going to be out of money real fast. So we've got to look at what's in the best interest of kids and what's in the best interest of kids under what we can afford. So, yeah, we're over what they recommend, but it's a recommendation. And so we're adding, we're adding positions in areas that are deficient. And so if we're going to transition a group of students here, and we're adding 350 students to a building where 6, 7, and 8 is a vulnerable time period for children, and I've got two of them in that grade band, so I'm speaking as a parent as well, the more counseling we get to that group, the better success opportunity they have for us. That's why I'm saying let's add a counselor here. It's needed in this transition. I don't see it needed otherwise, other than a recommendation from a group that hires counselors. Well, and the CDC. But, I'm, yeah, so I'm, I'm saying I would love to see another counselor. Yeah, I think it is needed. Um, but I heard you saying the price. Yeah. Yes? To follow up question on the, um, the special events for the sixth graders. My, my, my daughter will be at the last year at sixth grade. But for the other ones, what do they, I mean, they do this, for the band anyway, I don't know about orchestra special events, but for band they do the sixth grade band tour and all of that. Are they yeah. anticipating and doing that for them? Because that apparently is something that's been going on for years. Yes. And I, I mean, I've, that, I've only experienced it once, but, you know, the teachers have experienced it many years. Yeah. So are they going to do that yes. as well? Yes. Yep. Even with the different teachers that they'll have for bands and yep. things like so that. So Jeff and I have a list of all those activities that the sixth graders do, and we're just going to copy, paste, and replace <laughs> six with five. Okay. Dr. Yeah. I, I just wanted to comment. I think the band tour could actually still be kept in sixth grade. I don't see why the fifth graders have to do it. It could just take place from the middle. They could leave from the middle school and then go on the band tour, and it could still happen in the sixth grade year. Will you have a band? A band concert for four, five, and six, or you incorporate the six, seven, eight. Those are events? those are all the little things that I really haven't gotten to. This whole thing is: does it fit? Yes. Can we afford it? I don't know. It's eight hundred thirty-five thousand, and those pieces of it. Uh, does this solve the problem? Yes. I, I haven't gotten into the fine details, which is what. Let's do this in twenty twenty-one. Give us a full year to work out those types of things. But I want the end of fifth grade to look like the end of sixth grade for those students. That's the whole goal in my mind as this transition comes through. That there's not something that they lose out on because they had to go to. And then the next year it's easy because now the fifth graders are the you know, <coughs> last group of graduating elementary students and, and it's, you know, all those activities are then available to them. Okay. Chrissy? all of sixth grade out of the elementary buildings, what changes do you anticipate 
for the elementary buildings? Is it going to stay exactly the same if the band teacher that travels between two buildings now doesn't have that load? Is something different? Are the elementary kids going to be experiencing changes as a result of the staff changes and things like that? Not less, that's for sure, because nothing's leaving that they don't have access to now. So that would create more time for band teachers and you know th those things that you just mentioned. Again, that's in the finer details, but I don't see it having much of an impact in, on K-5 in a negative manner whatsoever. Yes? Will the elementary band and orchestra instructors then be helping out with the sixth grade as at the middle school level, or will the, sixth, the middle school it's a share because we're adding a, a band teacher we're adding a music teacher in here so that is going to take the lion's share of the load wherever it is there it is music teacher right and i'm talking about the band right? yeah yes. <laughs> that person will do it <laughs> that, that one okay. the new one yeah Okay, so you're looking for specialized things too, though. So if we hire this person and they're more of a vocal music person, then that's where the expertise of the orchestra and the instrumental music teacher that we currently have here comes to help this situation. So it's going to depend upon what the strength is of this person. We hire a really good orchestra person here. Now, the instrumental music and the vocal music help out with those two pieces. So, yes. Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. I, I get it now. No. It will not draw from the elementary. This ad plus the expertise that we currently have is what's going to help us to really get that structure moving. Yes? Um, I don't know how it is today for the school, but are there um, after school activities like chess club or things like that? And if there are, would this be things that would be open in the sixth grade? Yes, and a lot of those happen in that homeroom period that I was talking about, but yes, there are after school activities. And that was whenever I was talking about the negatives with this, the one negative I felt about moving sixth grade up is that, that athletics at the middle school level under the PIAA and National Federation begin in seventh grade. So no sixth graders are eligible for school sports. And I didn't like the fact that I have a student in this building that has activities in this building that they don't have access to. That was one of the negatives I said three years ago. But it opens the sixth grade up to those other activities that we have like the play. So we can now have sixth graders on that stage in the school play where that's not the case today. Part of this, we could have a sixth grade chorus now that we've added a vocal music activity into this. So there's a lot of those types of activities plus the whole function of the middle school also has those clubs built into it and those happen at the end of the day in that period plus intramurals and those types of things that yes, we're going to involve the sixth graders in. So that's all, again, positive benefits to, to them being here. Yes? Um. So I have a current sixth grader, so I mean, this is like kind of not relevant to her, it's, I'm more here for the one that's coming up behind her. But the middle school schedule, you said the, the sharing like that they can pick between band and orchestra and choir is the way it currently is in seventh grade as well? Yes. Okay, so like that's not something that's gonna be changing next year. She's in orchestra and choir. Mr. Lieberman will work with you to get that schedule to work out to do as much as they can from both pieces. Okay, I was going to say, she had been told that she would be able to do both, and she's yeah. really looking forward to doing yeah. both, and she was a little upset when I mentioned that that might not be possible. Yeah, no, it, it's it's a small handful of students that we then hand schedule through, okay. the, through the office to, to see if we can make it work, and we've been pretty successful in the past to make it work. And there's a number of factors that are involved sure. in that, but um, we've been able to make it work in the past. So you'll work with Mr. Lieberman when it comes time to schedule. Okay. to make that fit, because that's not a normal 400 student right. model. It's, no, I know. it's very isolated, but that's the benefit of the big school with um, multiple teachers to be able to, to do something like that. Okay. Well, in that case, I appreciate the effort to include kids who have multiple interests like that, because it's, I know it doesn't apply across the board, um, and it's hard to do manually, but it, it makes a big difference for that. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, so I, I have a fourth grader, so this directly impacts me as well, um, and I am in favor of moving sixth grade, so I, you know, I don't take this lightly. But I did have a question about um, the transportation again really quickly, or, or just a comment, which is that 
I know that there are children that are bused from the middle school um, that then have to wait at Highcliffe and Westview, and those kids have a very long bus ride. I've mentioned this to you before. And I would just like urge us as a board and as a district to see if there's anything we can do to mitigate that situation and limit the amount of time that those kids are on the bus because it's, it's not fair when you know there are a small group of kids that have to ride the bus for uh, an exceptionally long time. So I just wanted to mention that concern. That's a good point. Yeah. I, 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 we looked at that last time. I know we had some issues with the bus. But I, and we will. I, I can figure, I'm sure we'll, we'll do that to make sure we don't still be sitting on the bus or whatever the time frame is. I also want to do apologize. I don't think that white paper you're talking about is actually posted yet. I imagine it will be, but it doesn't look like white it. White paper so will be posted yes. under Sorry. parent you links. Didn't want, you said everyone could go home and look at it, and I don't think that's true. Um, <laughs> Amanda got Hamilton tickets tonight. I couldn't make her stay back. <laughs> so we'll get that on the website um, for you as soon as we can. And, and seriously, if there's anything that you come across and it, you, it, you don't understand or you've got a question, just call my office. I'll talk to you. It's not a big deal. Um, I want to make sure that you're comfortable with this as well. Uh, you know, if you weren't concerned about it, you wouldn't be here right now. So you read through that paper. If it doesn't sound right or you got a question about it, just call me. Want to, you need to come in and talk to me for us to go over numbers? Come on in. We'll go through it. It's, I'd be happy to go through that stuff with you. Yeah. <coughs> It's the number of time it takes to make all the runs happen. And so we, we sandwiched the elementary High Cliff and Westview runs inside the middle school run 10 minutes up away from the, from the middle school dismissal. So when they dismiss, they dismiss, and the buses that are taking the High Cliff and Westview middle school students home stop at High Cliff and Westview to take the K-6 students home. So it's an effort to consolidate time and buses. And so that's where a lot of that savings came in. So when you take the high school, those students are from the entire district population. So that's the whole footprint of the district. The middle school is the exact same way. So we wouldn't be able to get the middle school students all home to the entire uh, district footprint and back to Ross or back to Highcliff and Westview in a short period of time to create that dismissal. So if we broke it apart and just let the high school dismiss and go, come back, middle school dismiss, go, come back, then run the elementaries, we're about an hour and 15 minutes later, which then means that our elementary populations are gonna get home much later than what they currently do. So the lion's share of our transportation model is based upon the elementary students, not the high school students. So we have buses making four runs. So we have a bus that will do the high school, the middle school that also includes Highcliff and Westview, or not both. Then they'll also go and do a Ross or a McIntyre run. So we're getting the efficiencies out of one bus by having them do multiple runs than if we did it all the elementary schools on one block means that they're doing one run, then one middle school, then one high school. So that's three runs. Right now, we have about 15 of 32 buses that are doing four runs. Then you have to add in all the private and parochial school runs that we do because we're transporting to about 54 schools. So all of those things have to fit into this nice little puzzle to get everybody here and home in a, in a uh, reasonable amount of time. And so what happens in that model, and it's in the paper, if we put all four elementary schools back on the same model and spread that apart, it really makes the elementary schools, it's like a 10 o'clock to 5 o'clock day because of the way you need to be able to transport everybody through the entire district. Uh, so that's what makes it so difficult. So you're, you have to create a model that they tie together so your buses are doing multiple runs, or at that point we're going to double the bus number to make it work. So that's the puzzle that Jerry gets to solve. <laughs> 
Florida is saying, you know, in the North Hills of states, our kids have like three or sometimes four people. Well, they shouldn't be, they're scheduled at 84 passengers and it's a percent of 84. So 84 passenger bus. So some of them are, are they're not fully scheduled three to a seat. Um, and we do have students in assigned seats so that, so that it's not that way. We know that 100% of our students do not ride the bus. I don't know where they're coming from though. So that's part of the difficulty. You know, so if half your neighborhood drove their students. They all have a seat on a bus. There's probably plenty of space um, because they're, they're scheduled at a 95% capacity, Jerry. And the bus doesn't have more than how many kids on it at 84 passengers. It's, it's like 75 or something like that is the max capacity that we schedule on an 84 passenger bus. Well, from what I hear, the middle school students in the afternoon sit with their feet up and all at the low Just give me the bus number. We'll pull the bus tape. We have audio and video. And if that is occurring, the student will be disciplined for it because it's unacceptable behavior here. Okay. So send me the bus number. Jerry will pull the video. We'll pull the student right in and say, is this you? Are you doing this? This has to stop. You can't do this. Okay? Because they're scheduled. They're not scheduled beyond what the bus capacity can hold. And, and so that's where, yeah. And, yeah, at the first pickup, it's a little, it's, it's tighter, okay? When you're leaving the elementary school, it's tight. Every student that's going home in that direction is on it. First stop, a number of students get off. A number of students get off. So, I guess the earlier the stop, the, the tighter it is. But they're not, they're, I don't want you to think that we're scheduling an 8 passenger bus at 105, which is what it's sounding like. It's not the case. Okay? And yes. Allie's right, that's a long run. I'll be honest with you. Some of those middle school, Westview, middle school, Hagliff runs are long runs. Um, are long. And, from, from the yeah. middle school to the home. And, and the, the solution is write the check. And so that's where we've got to take a look at, at what, how we're handling this. Yes? It would take me an hour to explain the entire transportation model. <laughs> it's, a, it's a moving puzzle uh, of multiple runs. Because we'll have buses that will do a high school run, a private and parochial school run, and an elementary run. Because you've got to fit all of those in. It's all based upon time, number of students, direction it's going, miles traveled, all of those variables uh, piece into it. So that's why it's not just that, it's not that easy. I wanted to have just one more comment on the busing, just a little piece of history. One of the things that this busing model did for us with the time change was to not have both the middle school and the high school releasing at the same time. So both as, um, and as was the case when my son was in, on the hilltop. So as a parent driver myself, and then as the parent of a new driver, I don't know which was worse, honestly, but it was, um, you know, it was a real safety risk up here when everything was dismissing at once. So, you know, people sometimes will ask us, well, would you ever think about doing that again? And all you have to do is just envision what it was like. And I think you'll see that the answer, we're much better off with the split. Okay. I actually have a comment for the board, if I can. I'm Chrissy Evans from Westfield Elementary. So I know that this probably is not going to happen, that you guys would say, we're not going to take Dr. Mandarino's suggestion, and we're just going to let this write out. See how next year's numbers are. Um, and I would urge you not to do that, because the PTAs and PTOs and PTSOs, we are the ones that do a lot of these traditions and the launching and the celebrating and the paying for these things, and we desperately need time to plan and do extra fundraising. So if you're going to accept Dr. Manorino's recommendation, I would urge you to do it in the time frame that now. he says, <laughs> because none of us want to let this linger next year and not have any ability to plan for it. <laughs> I mean, it's not that somebody has a better option. Better. No, what she's talking about is that yeah, we talked right. about this with the PTA, uh, PTA, oh, SO, so I get all the groups.
and talked about what some of the options could be. And, and I've been saying for years, I'll tell you how long we can sustain this model when you tell me how many kindergarten students we have. Mm -hmm. And so I always do that third day enrollment presentation in September. And so I could literally come to you in September and say, okay, here's kindergarten, now move them up. Okay, do they fit? We could make this work one more year. Do you want to wait one more year? So that's what Chrissy's saying. Chrissy's saying, don't do the let's wait and see model one more year. Let's, let's make a decision that we're going to do this in 2021 and let's move on from it. Regardless of what happens to the numbers, this, and I'm not putting words in your mouth. And just let's plan for this for 2021. Make it the event that it's going to be and do it. And if I get 175 students in kindergarten next year, we deal with it. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I don't yeah. think that's going to be the case because there's 209 registered already. And registration begins on February 18th. <laughs> okay. Uh, on, on, real, on behalf of the board, thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you all for your questions, for engaging uh, us uh, in your concerns and thoughts. And as Dr. Manorino said, please feel free to call him. And, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Can they call you? <laughs> or they'll tell you he's not here. Everybody's uh, no, always just kidding. Well. But, no, but, uh, but thank you. And well, obviously, all the questions were uh, extremely uh, great questions and uh, we and especially the busing thing we we know we have a lot of work to do there this is nobody wants our children sit on the bus for 40 minutes to go two miles so uh, that we're, we're gonna have to work on and we have to make sure that that, that does work out and we will we'll, we'll get it to, be, to work it's just a matter of uh, putting the model together but uh, thanks again for all of you for showing up this evening and voicing your concerns and thoughts and support uh, uh, so that we can uh, keep this thing moving and uh, again unless Unless some miracle happens, uh, I don't know that we have another option at this point. So I, you know, we are kind of leaning, obviously, in that direction. So, will we be voting on this next month? <sighs> you don't have to take a formal vote. If you want to, you can make a motion now to take yeah. my yeah, recommendation. I mean, we, we could. You can do it in February. I, whatever, I, whatever I mean, you feel comfortable I doing. I mean, I think we should. I'm not saying that we need to do it right now, but right. I think we need to do it sooner rather than later, yeah, you know, out of respect for the PTA, mm -hmm. OSOs. Right. Do you want us to put this as an agenda item for February? Uh, I'd be happy, we'd be happy to do that. We can do I that. I would like that. Yeah. I mean, I think that gives people a little extra time for exactly. feedback at that point, right. you know, because yeah. you just yeah. need to call the questions. Stuff. And, okay. yeah, and we'd like to try to have the whole board here. Right, exactly. Time. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you once okay. again. Mr. One recommendation. Maybe we delay because we have to look getting through this budget year. This is going to affect the following budget year. Right. So I think let's look at after this yeah. current budget yeah. year to go with it. Well, again, we could at least put it back on for another discussion. I'm, I'm yeah, again, I, but I, I, I just, right, being, just being, yeah, just being, I'm putting some common sense in this thing. We, we don't have another choice unless. I just don't know what another choice I, I is. I agree with you. So, okay. but so this, this budget year is going to affect what's well. going to happen <laughs> in that year also. So let's see what exactly. this budget year does. Okay. All right. Um, we could now move on to... Next uh, on our death by PowerPoint, Dr. <laughs> Taylor. Is that right? Okay, it's education, then Mrs. Mathis. So. Uh, we have another presentation. Oh, great. Dr. Taylor will now present the district's annual academic achievement update. This okay. presentation will provide an overview of the district's student achievement on various standardized assessments administered throughout the school year. Okay. Thank you and good evening. And... Uh, since we're about two hours into this meeting, I'm going to decrease my commentary on the data slides. Um, but I will tell you, it is my great pleasure to share with you tonight our annual academic achievement update. Um, our district is very fortunate in that we have great students with supportive parents and amazing teachers. And so that's a recipe for success. Um, although our district measures academic achievement in, in many different ways, um, in both summative and formative ways, we, we typically use five standardized assessments, five standardized assessments to really kind of compare ourselves for achievement. So I'll start off with those. We have the PSSA, the Keystone exams, the SAT, advanced placement exams, and the NOCTI exams. So let's start off with the 2018 PSSAs. First, I want to share some information about the PSSAs. They're administered in grades 3 through 8 in English language arts, mathematics, and science. Um, usually, they're administered in April. Um, before sharing the data with you, I do want to share that last year, the Pennsylvania Department of Education changed the structure of the PSSAs. So what they did was two things. Number one, they were 
reduce the amount of time um, students take the PSSA, and then because of that, they had to reweight the structure of the questions and the students' scores, the reporting categories. So it's really difficult to compare last year's 2018 PSSA to the previous year in 2017 because they really are two different tests. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, with that, we'll start off with the English language arts. And uh, this chart that I'm going to show you is going to show you the passing rates. So the students who pass the PSSA with a proficient or an advanced <laughs> rating. Um, and on the gray bars are the state averages, and the red bars are North Hills. So as you can see, we uh, well exceed the state averages in our passing rates. And I don't know why it's jumping around on me. Um, a couple of areas that are really interesting to me. In fifth grade, we're 24% higher than the state average, and 23% in, uh, higher than in sixth grade. Um, I'm really excited about the sixth grade score of 86% passing rate. Two years ago, we put in a study sync curriculum, which is basically the entire ELA curriculum is on their iPads. And we've had a lot of success with that curriculum. And 86% uh, obviously shows that our teachers are doing an amazing job, and our students are, are really learning well from those. Um, programs. Although we, we look at the passing rates, um, we, at North Hills we have a higher bar. You know, we want to look at more than just passing. We want to see how many kids are advanced. So each year what I do is I look at also how many students are scoring at the advanced level on these state assessments. Um, so in this next chart, you're going to see the percentage of students scoring at the advanced level on the ELA PSSA. And the gray bars, once again, are the state averages and the green are going to represent the percentage of our students who are scoring advanced on these assessments. Um, each of our grade levels uh, far surpass state averages, and um, in some of them we actually double the percentage of state averages scoring advanced, so we have a lot to be proud of there. Next, let's take a look at mathematics. Come on. In mathematics, uh, very similar. Um, we do very well in uh, our mathematics scores as well. One thing I do want to mention before I, I throw the, this graph up there is that um, s a number of years ago now, the state changed the PSSA two versions ago, and they aligned the math PSSA to the Common Core Standards for Mathematics. And when they did that across the entire state, you saw all school districts' math PSSA scores plummet. So when I show you these state averages and our averages, you're not going to see the 86% that you saw in ELA. So I just want to preface it with that. Um, so our state averages are in gray. So you see 31%, 39%. And then here's um, our scores and our passing rates. Again, we do an excellent job with our mathematics. Um, in some cases, again, <coughs> we almost double the rate. Uh, sixth grade is 33% higher than the state average. Fourth grade is 28% higher. And looking at the advanced again, on our advanced, we have um, a number of areas where we basically double. The third PSSA, I, I'm trying to move quickly in the interest of time for you, um, is the science PSSA. And we do a great job in science as well. 95% of our students in fourth grade are passing the science PSSA, which is an amazing number when you consider that we have more than 5% of the students in fourth grade are um, in learning support. So to say that we have 95% passing is, is really an amazing number for us. Looking at the advanced students on the science PSSA, we have 60% and 31% are scoring at the advanced level which other schools constantly are calling me and asking me, you know, how do you do this? Why are they so high? And other schools that are in similar demographics, they just, they don't know how to get to where we're at. And I think that's a, a testament, again, to once again, to our amazing teachers, great students, and supportive parents. So each year, what I do <laughs> is I compare our grade level uh, percentage of advanced scores, and I compare them to other schools in Allegheny County. And I call it my, my, basically my top 10% list. And sometimes I have all four schools listed on here, some like McIntyre and Ross and Highcliffe and Westview. And this year, just, it just happened that Ross swept all the rankings. Um, so you can see this year, 
They have top 3%, top 2%, top 2%. And what's important to note about this slide is that Allegheny County is one of the most highest achieving counties in the state of Pennsylvania. And so for us to be ranked in these top tier percentages in Allegheny County is really something to say for our school district. Keystone exams are the end of course exams that were originally designed to be graduation requirements and the state kept pushing it down and pushing it away and putting it off. Um, so they're taken at the end of Algebra 1, 10th grade literature and in biology. In the first chart, we're going to look at Algebra 1. Students take Algebra 1 in different grade levels, anywhere from 6th grade up to 9th grade. There's our state averages, and there is North Hills. So one of the questions when I, when I show people our data that they, um, they may ask is, well, why is 9th grade, state and North Hills, why is it so much lower? Well, when you take your students and they start taking it, some of them in 6th grade, every year that class moves up a grade level you're taking the higher achieving students and they're no longer taking Algebra 1 because they took it. So now they're in Geometry or Algebra 2 or, or Statistics. And so when you get to ninth grade taking Algebra 1, what's happening is what's left is the students who have always struggled in math. These are the kids who are either have IEPs or just have math deficiencies. Some cases these are students and who have uh, English as a second language and they have a hard time even communicating. So that's why you're seeing a 53% there and a 38% to state level in ninth grade. Here's our literature scores. Again, 82% versus the state 67%, <coughs> which is an increase over last year's score. And then um, the one that we are struggling with right now is in our biology keystone exam. We are right there at that state level average, and we're not pleased with that. Um, we've been working with our biology teachers. I will say that this, I'm a former biology teacher, and I looked at the sample questions. This test is very similar to a final exam you would see in a college freshman level biology course. It's that rigorous. It is very, very challenging. Um, so students really struggle with this. <clears throat> um, so we are working with our biology teachers to come up with action plans to uh, figure out how we can increase our achievement on this exam though. Dr. Taylor, what grade is that? Ninth grade. They do grade. the bio biology. Ninth grade. Is it true that some of the eighth grade students take biology? Or is it just the ninth it's, grade? It's ninth Only grade. taught in ninth uh -huh. grade. Okay. What about tenth if they don't? If they don't take it in ninth grade for some reason, whether it's a special education student and they kind of skip it for a year, they could take it in tenth grade. Okay. I have a question about that. For a while, we had some populations of students who took it in ninth or tenth, and then when they were juniors or seniors, had to go back and take the Keystone. Right, have all those classes graduated now? Are we now caught up where we're testing students as they take the class? Or do we still have some groups of students who are taking the test years, a couple years after they've completed the class? We, we do actually have a, a very small amount of students are taking the okay. test after they took biology because it's a retest. So if they did not pass it in ninth grade, they might take it again in 10th or 11th grade. But, um, but people it's who a took very it, small number. Okay, but have the classes that took it originally at a different year now all graduated? Yes. We're not seeing them in this data at all. Mm. Okay. This is first time test takers in ninth grade. Yeah, okay. that, that's, that's where I was going to in that, but that same thing. Is yeah, I remember that, that we had we, the, some of the kids that took it, the exam yeah. in 11th grade and hadn't had right. biology since ninth. Right. right. So we, that, those kids gone. are not in that data. Okay. That's I knew it was going to take a couple years till they all yep. graduated. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, I believe we're all familiar with the SATs. Um, similarly, the SATs actually went through a, a major overhaul about a year and a half ago, so they changed as well. Um, on the regular SAT, not subject specific, there are two portions of it. Um, it's the evidence-based reading and writing section and then the mathematics section. The maximum number of points for each section is 800. Um, this is the evidence-based reading and writing section. Our average last year was 579, whereas the state was at 547, and the country was at 536. This represented a 4% increase for North Hills over the 2017 data. In mathematics, 576, 539 for Pennsylvania, 531 for the country, and this represented a 2% increase over the previous year. 
Moving on to our, our fourth assessment is the advanced placement exams. Um, advanced placement exams are given to students taking any course that's designated as AP. Um, we offer 27 advanced placement courses, which is one of the highest uh, numbers of offerings of all the high schools in Allegheny County. And uh, students who score, basically, if you get a three or higher, it's on a scale uh, to five. It's the, it's the maximum score you can get is a five on AP. And generally speaking, if you get a three or five, four or five, it's a passing score. Most colleges will accept um, that as, as college credit. Um, so when we look at this, we're looking at for scores of three or higher. And one thing I, I'll note is between our advanced placement courses and our, our kids scoring at fours and fives on this, plus our college and our high school classes, we actually have students leaving North Hills High School with enough college credits that they can either skip the first semester of their freshman year of college or almost their entire freshman year of college has been wiped out because they took uh, courses here, which saves families a tremendous amount of tuition money. So we're really proud of our programs here. Um, 2018 data, 82% of the students in AP courses got a three or higher, which is a really great score. Um, Pennsylvania was 68 only, and globally it's 61. So you can see we're significantly higher than our peers in Pennsylvania. And this was actually an increase of 7% over our 2017 data. Each year, when I break this down by individual courses of passing rates, I create our own little North Hills Honor Roll, I call it, for AP. Um, and this year we had actually more courses on the AP honor roll than we've had since I started doing this. Um, these are the percentage of uh, classes with a 90% passing rate. So if I had um, a class of AP environmental science, 100% of the kids in that AP course passed that AP exam, which is you know, tremendous, absolutely tremendous. Again, amazing teachers, great students, good supportive parents, and you're seeing these, uh, these kinds of scores. Lastly is the NOCTI at the Beatty. Um, Beatty students taking national standardized assessment in their content areas. And uh, last year, 87% of our students passed the NOCTI test, which again, is a great number. Absolutely amazing. Are there any questions? Do you have, do you have any um, state statistics or national statistics for the Beatty? I can get this for you tomorrow. Okay. It's much lower. It's also much lower than the other three. Uh, tech centers around us. Okay, just curious. Any other questions? No. Thank, you, Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have two quick informational items before I go on to the other agenda items. Uh, the first is that the celebration of learning is coming up at the elementary schools on Thursday, February 7th from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and the second is that there is a kindergarten forum on January 30th from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. The forum is targeted for parents of incoming kindergarten students, and the event will provide parents information regarding kindergarten readiness, the kindergarten curriculum, and an opportunity to interact with administrators and teachers. Moving on to the other agenda items. Uh, the first is a request for the board to approve a contract with Navigate Prepared. Navigate Prepared is uh, going to provide the district with a digital tool for creating and disseminating our new safety and security plan. Um, the cost of this plan is $13,000, which is being paid for through a grant um, from the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency from the state that we all approved last month. The next is an acceptance of the PA SMART grant award in the amount of $35,000 from the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Uh, these funds are going to be used, uh, $10,500 of these funds are going to be used to provide our computer science teachers with targeted professional development in computer science. And $24,500 will be used to purchase hardware, um, devices such as robots, related products, and training to expand our computer science curriculum. Uh, we have a request for the board to accept a grant for $500 from uh, McDonald's to support STEM education. This was applied for by a computer science elementary teacher from Ross. And the grant is going to be used to purchase STEM and physical computing resources for students at Ross Elementary. Uh, a request for the board to approve the MOU with the Allegheny County Department of Human Services. 
The Allegheny County Department of Human Services provides services to residents that include programs serving the elder elderly, mental health services, drug and alcohol services, child protective services, um, and more. The purpose of the MOU is to allow DHS and the school district to share data to ensure that our students receive appropriate support services by both the district and Allegheny County. And through this MOU, the district will receive reports on foster students and homeless students. Um, and then next, we have an informational item, just an update on how our elementary um, Spanish online pilot program went. Um, the total number of students registered for the program ended up being 19, and only 37% of the students passed the course, which was pretty disappointing. Um, I know, Dr. Taylor, you, you had a couple of brief comments you wanted to add on that. Um, you know, we prefer in our school district that, that students learn face-to-face -face with our teachers in our classrooms. Uh, certainly there are cases where the, the student needs an online course, but uh, learning an online course is hard enough, but then if you have an elementary student trying to learn an online core, or online world language, it's very challenging. Um, this is one of the reasons why the district has had, um, you know, problems with cyber charter schools. And so, we certainly uh, want to offer these kinds of programs to our students, but it's our belief it's in the best interest to do it in face-to-face -face environments. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it, it's disappointing that language is not introduced at an earlier age. I've talked about this publicly before, so I'd like to continue to explore ways that we could do that as a district. Um, so, uh, moving on, the superintendent recommends, and I so move, that the board approve education items two through five. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we can now move on to athletics and activities. Ms. Cazero? Yep. And before I get to the agenda items, I also had, um, I wanted to talk about um, something that we had been working on. Um, a little less than a year ago, the township and our athletic director started to work together to um, talk about a project that we could work on with the township and specifically it would involve turfing Herb Field. Herb Field is the field that is located at the Ross Community Center and while I believe it's owned by the township, it is used by the school district. Um, last year in particular and before that as well, um, we've experienced some real difficulties being able to use the field because of the state that it's in. Um, due primarily to the amount of rain that we've had. Um, so I think um, and the basically for days and days after, the, after any rain occurs, the field is just, it, it's really, it's got some real drainage issues and so it's real, been real difficult to use. So um, Joe Laslovic is here and um, I'm not gonna put him on the spot or anything, but he um, was, has been working with um, Amy Schooneman our director of athletics to um, to come up with a plan um, to for us to work together with the township to come up with um, proposal to turf that field um, that would be mutually beneficial to the district and to the township. Um, it was put on hold for some time because of um, cost considerations, but um, we started to work together again um, earlier this month. And um, I think that we are coming together, um, you know, getting a plan together, which um, I don't, um, we're not in a position, like we're still iron ironing out the details, but um, I believe that the board as the majority is, and I don't know if that we need to take any sort of formal action or vote at this point, but um, that we don't really have anything to vote on right. because we're still working on the details here, but, um, but that we are generally speaking in favor of working with the township to, um, to make this project happen. So um, it's, you know, it's a good opportunity for us to work together and it's something that will benefit our students. Um, the plan is to turf the entire field which would allow the baseball to, um, players to use it as well as other sports such as soccer. Um, and so it's really an exciting chance for um, many of our local residents to um, be able to benefit from um, a much better facility. Um, I sent the board some details on what we have so far and we were going to continue to work together on that project. So, um, so thank you to uh, Mr. Laslovic and Mr. Corbel are both here, our, two of our Ross Township Commissioners. So, um, so I just wanted to mention all that um, just, you know, so everybody had that background. Um, if, and I guess if anybody has any comments, they can mention it here or later. Yes. I have a comment. Mm -hmm. At this point, um, I am not in favor of doing this. Okay. Uh, uh, and I will get uh, 
give further details in, uh, in the future on, on my reasons for it. Okay. I'm, okay. If there's anything uh, we can talk, I mean, we can continue to talk oh, yes, about it. But, uh, yeah. The thing is, let's, let's get our roads repaired on schedule. We're three to five years behind in our paving. And uh, I can't get out of my driveway without my uh, uh, car scraping. Uh, and I'm told that I can't, they can't do anything about it because if they remove the cur curb, the, all the water in the street will run down my driveway. So uh, I have an issue with, with uh, our paving. And to do my street, they have to get down to the roadbed mm. and then build it up rather than just uh, uh, skimming it over when they, in the normal program. So that's my issue. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I have a comment. Um, I, I just want to say I'm in favor of this. I'm excited about this opportunity for the um, community and for the district and the township to work together. Um, and I appreciate all the work that's gone into it so far. And I'd like to add, I did set in on a meeting for the first time, and I got a lot of excellent um, knowledge from these young ladies that are working on this with our commissioners, and I think it would probably be a fantastic thing for our youth. I really do. Yeah, the only thing... Sandy, I don't yep. know if this was discussed or not, but <clears throat> for many, many years, 20-some years, I was on Westview Ross's board, mm -hmm. and I know that it, uh, probably 10 years ago or so, the township began charging us a fee mm -hmm. to use Herb Field. And it, and it was a minimal fee, but sure. still, as a nonprofit yeah. youth organization, we kind of like went up there and fought it. Yep. But I'm wondering, if they turf this field, are they going to pass some of that expense on to the youth, and I'm talking to youth. I know that mm -hmm. uh, a lot of wooden bats, uh, leagues use it, men's leagues, softball yep. leagues. I have no problem charging them more. Mm -hmm. But the youth, sure. uh, the, the kids that use it in our community, are, is there any talk about raising the prices for them? I mean, I, um, I believe, that I know there's a meeting scheduled with Westview Ross and North Hills Athletic and the soccer club to, um, to talk about the pricing structures and to give them an opportunity before we, you know, fully commit to this to kind of discuss what their concerns are. Um, I don't want to, you know, put words in their mouth, but I know that they have talked about, you know, how they're going to structure the fees for that, um, you know, that, that usage. And I think that they will have an opportunity to, you know, voice any concerns and issues that they have the um the presidents of the of those three groups in particular because i know they are i think the primary youth groups that use it around here and right. as you mentioned there are men that use it as well right but i, yep. I mean that would be something i would be concerned about yep. i mean those okay younger kids yeah, absolutely benefit from the field more yeah, so than the adults mm -hmm. yeah um, we can get um we'll get if, those details if there's a way that we could keep that cost, keep the cost down. down absolutely Thank you. All right, sure thing. And I just wanted to add, I'm excited mm -hmm. about the possibilities of expanding that use of the field to yep. other sports and to mm -hmm. other students because, it, I mean, we're, you know, with 14 square miles of the school district and the township and, and Ross and Westview, the more bang we can get for our buck, the more our residents can, <coughs> you know, can use our facilities. Um, and anything that we can get to do double duty, I think, just mm -hmm. benefits all of us in the long run. So I really like that we're thinking creatively. It's not just solving the problem for one sport. We're thinking right. about different ways that can impact, a, you know, a lot of kids and families. Yeah, so, um, I'm, you know, glad that we're working on this, and I'd uh, like to see it, you know, more as we get more information. Yeah. Well, you know, there. for me, the the elephant in the room, so to speak, is is the uh, details on the expenditures. You yep. know, we have right. a tremendous f f fiduciary responsibility right. to our taxpayers to mm -hmm. make sure that right. we're using this wisely. So, I see some of the information in terms of the the approximate cost for turfing, but you know, I think that just uh, touches on the surface. I'd like to see, mm -hmm. you know, what the overall cost might be, what costs to uh, extend it out over a period of time, how mm -hmm. long the turf's going to last, you know, yep. all those yeah. sorts of things, and um, and then also maybe in connection with that, who who maintains the ownership in terms mm -hmm. of use of that field, right? Mm -hmm. so those yeah, those are yeah, those are things we've started details. to talk about a little bit, and we'll continue to talk about those. Um, there is a cost yeah. associated with keeping the field as it is, mm -hmm. and it would um, you know it's mm -hmm. not it's not nothing, and we also can't use it. So um, when you kind of factor that in, it 
I, I think it makes more more sense. But I, I definitely think those are things that we need to. And you know, from our perspective, we, we have a field over here, which is well, we have something so, over. Yeah, here. we do. But uh, there's an, there's so many sports that they can't. Um, you know, they, they can use that field, but that doesn't cover everybody that needs to. Oh, no, to for not to me, we wouldn't use that field at all. But, sure. but <laughs> beside that, yeah. we have that field. So what are our overall plans for that space over there? Mm -hmm. Are we going to continue to use it? Is, is there going to be some cost involved? And I'm sure there are. Mm -hmm. you know, that that right. kind of thing that we need to talk yes. about. Or does that open up yet some new possibilities, yeah. you know, for some other things that we can right. do? So, and I think the, um, you know, trying to get the most bang for our buck from where, you know, from where we can spend, you know, because as, uh, as Sandy mentioned, there's cost to not doing anything. So inaction is not, as Pat said with the sixth grade, inaction is not free either. So, you know, where do, how do we want to spend our money that we're mm -hmm. going to get the best benefit out of it? Since we've got to spend it anyway. Mr. Nitty? I would like to suggest that we uh, get some estimate of the cost of turfing the hilltop. We looked at it about eight or ten years ago, and it was about $700,000 now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason we didn't do it was because the junior, junior high at the time was playing football there. Mm -hmm. But that's, that situation's gone away, so it could be strictly used for... Uh, it's well over a million dollars. I can just tell you about the size of that footprint out there. Well over a million. It's bigger than a football field. And a football field is going to be about a million. So you're well over that number. And then that's not going to include all of the drainage and everything else that's causing our tennis courts to crumble and fall apart. And just my two cents in this whole thing is neither of us can afford to do it on our own, and both of us need it. And so I'd like to, for us to work together to find a way to make it a possibility. And if we can't make it a possibility, we can't make it a possibility. But both of us need it. And neither of us can afford it by ourselves. Okay. okay. Looks like you're going to earn your paycheck here in the next couple of months. Wow. Dr. Manorino, don't we have a, a <laughs> rake? We have a rake for our stadium? Yeah, we have the groomer. So, I mean, yeah. we'd be able to share that yeah. with the township. They wouldn't have to purchase a new one. So, that's a savings to them. I. Yeah. Uh, we could work something on I'm sure. Yeah, that's not. Okay. I think we have two. I think we have one at McIntyre also. Okay. Yeah. Mm. I, I don't know no, what they cost. I'm just thinking. Sure. No, the the groomer, the, big, the brush. Yeah. Maybe it Ross. I thought okay. it was, no, it's a big, it's a, it's a brush. Thing, it's a big, brush. but it goes big onto the tractor. It right. goes on the back. Right. Yeah. It's like a, it looks like an infield drag, but it's basically a brush. Okay. Right. That's oh. what I was thinking. Yeah. All right. All right, Sandy. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much for mm -hmm. those points. It's really helpful, I think, in in determining you know what our next steps are and what we need to focus on. Um, so thanks very much. Um, so I have. One item, a field trip request for the Future Business Leaders of America. Um, the request is that the board approve the field trip request um, to compete at the FBLA State Leadership Conference in Hershey, um, departing on April 7th and returning April 10th, 2019. Um, the students will miss three days of school. Um, the bu activities budget um, covers $2,800 of the trip, and the students um, are fundraising the rest. Um, depending on how many of them qualify, they have a, um, a goal amount. And so the um, only budget impact on this is the um, $2,800 from the activities budget. Um, so if um, the superintendent recommends, and I so move, that the board approve athletics and activities, item one. Which to clarify is just the field trip right. and not anything to do with the field. Second. Second. Thank, Thank you. Second. Is there any discussion? Uh, yes. I think everybody's <laughs> looking at me. They what know my <laughs> typical answer. Um, <clears throat> I, I will vote no on this trip. I vote no on any field trip that is over one and a half days of school missed. In this situation, the children are going to be missing three days of school. And uh, to me, that's unacceptable. So I'll be voting no. Thank you. Respectfully, may I just ask, Mr. Burnett, like, I, I think there's an educational value in, in field trips, so I'm just a little confused about why you I are agree, likely but to not approve them. <clears throat> I agree to some extent, but um, there are more than just business classes being taught to the students every day. They're missing out on their, their math, their social studies, some of the other areas. And I think this is just uh, directed or geared to one specific area. And um, in this case, I, I would guess it would be the leadership classes or business classes. <clears throat> so I, again, I don't think that they, they're, they're con they will miss their language classes, any of their other electives that they may have. 
I believe there's some competitions involved in this uh, mm -hmm. yeah. program yeah. also, yeah. which does bring some you know, uh, good public relations yeah. for the sure. school district also. Again, it's three days of school, and I'm opposed to it because they're missing three days of class. All right. Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 And Mr. Burnett is opposed, if you got that, Lori. Thank you. Uh, is there anything that we need to know about A.W. Beatty, Mr. Nudy? Uh, yes, there are two things. Where Mr. Uh, Kelly? Mr. Kelly. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I just, I just, just comment just on, on the bread that they <laughs> baked. <laughs> their, their pastry shop is excellent. It is. <laughs> well, I get that. That's for sure. Well, their bakery good. shop is excellent yeah. also. Yeah. That yeah. pepperoni bread was, mm -hmm. was super. That is good. Um, there are four students that qualified as students of the month from North Hills uh, for December and January. They, in the advertising design is Lauren Tate. In automotive technology is Taylor Rodney. In carpentry and building construction is Benjamin Senchak. And in HVAC is Jacob Wolf. And also, uh, at 11 o'clock tomorrow, uh, we're having a press conference of basically of all of the career centers in uh, uh, Allegheny County uh, to push for uh, additional state funding of uh, career centers. I plan on attending. Great. And Mr. Kelly? No. Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> all right. You're carrying the water. <laughs> all right. Thank you both for that. Um, Let's move on to personnel. That would be Mrs. Spade. Okay, personnel items are discussed in executive session. Therefore, the superintendent recommends and I so move that the board approve um, personnel items 1 through 10. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mrs. Spade. Uh, looks like we don't have anything under community intergovernmental relations. Do we have anything under legislative, Mr. Nudie? I, I know we don't have anything formally. Is there anything? No, there's nothing happening under legislative for the simple reason. Uh, the Senate has organized their education committee, mm -hmm. uh, but they have no um, uh, committee meetings uh, set yet. Okay. And uh, the House of Representatives has not organi organized their uh, uh, education committee, so... Uh, we're not going to see any action probably for another two months. Okay. Uh, a little bit of uh, uh, information on the uh, state of the pension fund. Mm -hmm. uh, good news. Uh, the fund will be funded 70% of their um, liabilities in 2020. Mm -hmm. And it will be fully funded in 2040. <laughs> now... That's an improvement of two years over the last two years. So uh, things are looking up. So, <laughs> looking forward to, to 2040. More people die, I guess. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll, we'll all be right? here 2040. All right. All right. There you go. Absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. New. Uh, policy, Mr. Kelly, anything that. Uh, Nothing before? to report. Thank you. All right. We can move on to finance, and uh, that'll be Dr. Nolish, but I just have one item there where, as a discussion item, uh, at least for the public uh, consumption. Uh, we are, as uh, most people know, we're starting into our budget uh, uh, time of, of figuring out what do we look for like next school year. We have to adopt that uh, in June. Uh, and as a result of that, part of what we're doing is um, also entertaining some possibilities of looking into how and why and all kinds of other reasons uh, well, in conjunction with our friends of the township of the business privilege and mercantile taxes to see uh, if there's any way we can improve those collections and and perhaps maybe improve those resources so we are in discussions uh, with uh, with the township uh, and trying to uh, perhaps uh, do a joint uh, venture if you will if that makes sense to, to look at uh, the po potential collection of those <coughs> business privilege and mercantile taxes as well as real estate assessments we're looking at all the angles to see if there's uh, any uh, anything that could be done there and how we can perhaps improve uh, our collection efforts uh, with respect to not only the business privilege taxes but also the real estate assessments. So we're we're doing that, and in in in, in, in addition to that, uh, I do uh, will expect that we will also contact the Westview Borough to see if they would be interested in in uh, joining the discussion when it comes to looking at the uh, 
business privilege taxes as well as a real estate assessment. So we'll be involving them. And uh, I guess you know the solicitor over there, so you can contact can him. Okay. <laughs> uh, that being said, so we're, right now we're in, we're in the discussion stage. Uh, there's a lot more that we have to go through, and uh, we are doing uh, we are doing some uh, research on that. So uh, I think that'll be uh, that'll be something we'll be discussing over here the next couple of meetings to see where, how how that comes about. And uh, and the other thing too, I just want to mention real quick was when we talked about our, our financial condition uh, earlier in the meeting. Uh, the other one of the other things I failed to mention, I would like to, I sh would like to mention is part of the the reason that our financial condition is to me very stellar uh, is the fact that we have, uh, for all intents and purposes, we've got labor harmony in the district, and I I want to say that that's that's a good thing that we have with our with our uh, union uh, folks, uh, teachers, and all the other groups that we, uh, we certainly uh, negotiate with. Uh, obviously, uh, both sides like to see more for each other. We get that. But I, I have to tell you, I'm very, uh, very encouraged of the relationship we have with all of our uh, uh, bargaining groups, and, uh, and especially to our teachers who have been, who played a vital role in, uh, uh, in doing what we do financially. So I want to just give them a shout out and say that we certainly appreciate that, and we are in, uh, we're always in <clears> discussions <throat> with these groups, and uh, they've uh, really stepped up to the plate in helping us, making sure that uh, we can continue to provide the services educationally and things of that, which is, again, part of why we, our financial condition seems to be, in, uh, at this point, in very good shape. So I just wanted to mention that, and there'll be more to come uh, at these next couple of meetings with regards to the business privilege and mercantile tax and real estate assessments. Uh, we're really at the beginning stages of all that. So. Dr. Nolish. Okay, thank Sorry. you. Um, we've got a number of items to go through as it is budget season, so we've actually got 10 action items. I'd like to go through them and then I'll make a motion for all 10 of them. Mm -hmm. They start with number two on the agenda. The first is the general fund bills. So since we're, we're, this is basically our let's pay some bills, um, we've got uh, construction fund bills, budget transfers, payroll for the month of December. Um, then we come to one we need to think about for a second, which is the approval of the audited financial statements. And I think, again, you know, just to echo uh, Mr. Wilgus' comments, we heard the presentation at the beginning. You know, I think our audited financial statements show that we are in good, solid position. And uh, so I recommend approving those. Um, we also have audit reports from the Township of Ross, the real estate tax collector's audit report. We're recommending the acceptance of that report and also the one from the Westview Borough. And those are both for uh, 2017. Um, okay. We have a resolution, 2019-1, and this is limiting authority to increase the real estate tax rate for 2019 to uh, 2020. And for those of you that have been uh, following this, this is the time of year uh, where we uh, uh, pass a resolution saying that any, any, if there is an increase to the real estate tax, that it will be um, no higher than the index of 2.3%. Um, Act 1 requires us to declare whether or not we intend to request a tax increase above the Act 1 index for the coming year. And so by approving this re resolution, we'll be waiving that option and the maximum increase that we could uh, enact would be the 2.3% uh, which is the Act 1 limit. Um, approving this re resolution doesn't say that we're going to uh, that we're planning on uh, raising taxes or to what level. Um, I think you'll uh, recall that most years we have been raising under the index and we've been working very hard to do that, to uh, try to help keep the community strong and to uh, keep the tax raises if we need to do them as low as we possibly can. And I have every expectation we're gonna be doing that same process again of trying to limit it as much as we can. We're gonna have some challenges as we're, we've heard, but we, you know, we're at the very beginning of that process. Um, so we need to work through that. But um, there is nothing that in our um, uh, budget that would indicate that we would need to uh, request to waive the, um, the limit. Um, and there's one more, bear with me. Okay, then this one is Resolution, resolution 2019-2, which authorizes us to participate in uh, 
the uh, Allegheny Intermediate Units Joint Purchasing Program, which uh, again is cooperative purchasing of supply items through the Allegheny Intermediate Unit mm -hmm. and is one of the ways that does help us uh, save some money and uh, stick to our budget. So the superintendent recommends and I so move that the board approve uh, action items number two through 11. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank okay. you, Dr. Nolish. There, there are there. two informational <laughs> items. If mm -hmm. anyone <laughs> needs some more numbers for their reading pleasure tonight, <laughs> we've got the summary statement of revenues and expenditures for our current fiscal year uh, for the month of November, and we have the revenue summary for the current fiscal year as of December. And that's thank it. You. I'm done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can now move to support services, and that would be Mr. Burnett. I'm just glad uh, Dr. Nolish had a lot of items because over here we went through three iPads and one um, <laughs> iPhone to get these things working. So uh, the batteries are dying here. <laughs> yeah, batteries die, and we got all kind of technical it's, problems it's here. So. Happy to oblige you, Mr. Burnett. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to have paper every once in a while. Absolutely. Right. Anyways, um, I have two items. Uh, they are change orders for the West Westview. Uh, vestibule and that's uh, GC 001 and also uh, change orders for uh, the high school and the roof replacement and that's G701-001 is there any questions on those I mean they're pretty self-explanatory I, I was just wondering oh. Go ahead. Um, on Westview the entryway has this um, skylight been replaced I haven't been in that vestibule the last few times I've been over there, so I need to go over there and check. Jerry, do you know? I don't know that. The skylight was delivered broken, and so it, it, it will be replaced as a part of what the, con, con, uh, the construction guys are going to do for us. I don't know if it's been replaced yet, because I usually enter yeah. through the cafeteria and go up the steps. I haven't been in that vestibule the last few times I've been over there, okay. but I can take a look for you. But it will be replaced at no cost to us. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to ask about the general status of the vestibule. If there was, I, last we spoke, I believe the district was going to be um, paying for some yeah, there's carpeting still some and air conditioning. Upgrades, uh, uh, carpeting, but it's functional? Bench and yeah, it's fully operational. Uh, yep. Heater. Okay. You know, the little things. All right. I guess you got to make a motion there, Mr. Burnett. i got to get back. Would you like me to make that motion <laughs> for you? I'm <laughs> no, I'll be glad to. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to approve the support item, support services items one and two. Second. Second. Okay, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Wilgus. Thank you. <laughs> and we come to, before we close the meeting, is, are there any, is there anybody here that would like to make public comments on non-agenda items? Oh, okay, wow. we got three. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you each have one minute now. Uh, whoever wants to, would you like to lay the... You can line okay. up. All right, go ahead. You could, if you don't mind, just step up and name an address, please, for the record, and then we'll go for there. Mine is very very brief. My name is Tori Valbrecht. I live at 114 Laurelwood Drive. And I just want to say I had the pleasure this last weekend of speaking with my dad. My dad is a uh, borough councilman up in Edinburgh mm. in Erie County and has been appointed to a countywide recruitment and retention committee on emergency services. Both my dad and I were volunteers at the fire department for a number of years there. So he was talking about the committee that they're you know they're exploring ways to embrace and engage their school districts and I pulled up our school districts website and said wait a minute we already do this <laughs> so I just wanted to say thank you to our board thank you that you know being able to put the, us out there as a model of what they want to accomplish they want to take it a couple steps further but really having a great model for them to emulate is fantastic Good so news. thank you thank you thank, thank, thank you for your you. comments thanks uh, who's wait, Steve? Do you, do you have something that uh, depends on who wants to? It's going to be a while. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're just waiting for the white paper, <laughs> so we can all go to bed. So I have a bunch of comments uh, that came Name up. Name address, this, please. Oh, I'm sorry, Ed Vesley, <laughs> one one six Lingay Drive. Thank you. So, first question is: I, I it's wonderful work. The audit report. I mean, that's wonderful news. Looks like we have a surplus of over a million dollars based on we didn't spend as much as we budgeted for. That's another great thing. So, 
I'm going to say the same thing I've been saying for about eight years now. Let's try to get those bleachers at McIntyre before we get that $835,000 bill next two years from now, because that is a significant hit. So I have a question regarding that. Is that number in $2,018, $2,019, $2,020? Is it inflated or is that the no, number it's, today? It's it's using the new higher number for each of those positions. So it would be step two on a salary structure plus benefits plus retirement, FICA, Social Security, and all of the pieces of the puzzle that it takes to employ a, a teacher. So, yeah, it's ballpark. We're negotiating a teacher's contract, but I'm using the step two, which is the first step number on our teacher's contract um, in those numbers. So if it goes up, it would go up slightly. Okay, I just want to have an idea. Um, second thing, uh, this goes to the field trip. Uh, I don't want to pick definitely on this particular field trip, but I know it was mentioned in a previous time when they, we, you guys were approving a field trip that there really is a cost associated with this. And maybe this isn't the case in this time, but don't the teachers who run the FBLA in this particular case go on the field trip with the students and so we're hiring a sub to <coughs> fill in so when we present that the cost is minimal or that two thousand eight hundred dollars that's not really true and I, I think we should really present it in a different way if we're sending let's say the baseball team or FBLA you know we should identify in the minutes how many teachers are going to be missing and how many teachers we have to sub for and what that cost should be. They pay for that cost. I was told in a previous meeting that they didn't pay for that like cost, depends, that we used to make them pay that cost. It depends on what it's for. So okay. if the baseball team qualifies for a playoff that requires a substitute, they don't pay for it. If they decide they're going to go to Florida for spring break, they pay for it. So it all depends on what the trip is. So this is a conference. It's also tied to a competition, and so the Future Business Leaders of America Club will pay for those substitutes. That's and that's in that $2,800? Part of that. Okay. I, I think it'd be nice if we cl more clearly identified that, what it includes. Just a, a note. So uh, let's talk about this turf it herb. Um, a couple things about herb that I think people should know. Um, first of all, it's a grass outfield, dirt infield. When that's, that field was built, the dirt doesn't, didn't extend as far back as it does now. For some reason, there's what I call infield creep. And that's either because the grass dies at the end of the, the field or however the, the Ross Township was maintaining it. So because of that, the runoff becomes worse and worse every year. Now, there's several solutions to that, which I'm not sure we want to go into, but two of them are you put grass back where you used to have dirt, which limits the, the soil erosion. Or the other thing that would be much less costly than putting turf everywhere is A, putting a tarp over it when it rains and taking it off. And yes, that's a pain in the butt, but it is something that costs about probably one-tenth of what the turf costs. And you got a bunch of high school kids, they can move, they can roll the tarp. It's not that heavy. I've done it. And I'm a lot older than they are. So that's one, that's a couple thoughts on that. Or you could just turf the infield, which is what we did at McIntyre, and you're able to get a lot of games in. So the other problem I have with it is a couple other things that the township has done over the years. When that whole complex was built, the, the upper field was supposed to be a, girls softball field or a small smaller field that never got built I was told that was because they ran out of money so they built this elaborate other field that's called herb now and that's great but what about the other field because one of the problems we have at McIntyre for example is we really can't put lights up because of its right its location near residence but herb has that opportunity now so you could build another second field out there that would give you a lot more opportunity than spending that much money on turf. The other thing I'm not convinced in, and the arguments I heard tonight is, is 
every time, and I've been on Wesley Ross board in like four years now, approximately, um, we always get this complaint. There's never any field time at Herb. So I don't know how you're going to squeeze soccer or other sports there. Baseball takes up all the time slots, whether it's seniors, whether it's youth, whether it's the school district team, they take up all the time slots. So I don't see how putting turf is going to magically create more slots. What happens now is our springs are wetter than they used to be. And so the problem is it really crunches the boys' baseball team because we have this PIA playoffs and all this other stuff that happens near the end of school year, and we have to get that all fixed in. So th these kids are trying to play baseball at the beginning of March in Pittsburgh. Let's face it, that's very difficult. So before we take that giant leap to support this big financial endeavor, and I would ask uh, Sandra if she doesn't mind sharing with us, I'm sure you guys have a cost of what that is right now. You have an estimated cost, right? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, what is that? I don't have it right in front of me. Joe, um, do you happen to have it or anybody of the, on the board? I'll, have to, I'll, dig, I'll dig around. I, just, I did want to make a couple points. Um, wasn't it like 28? I, I know, I know you do, but yeah. you've had some, you've had some inner conference, and, and so I'm sure some number has been talked yeah, about was, before um, you want to. It was about two hundred and eighty thousand for the school district, and then the rest would be covered by, and that's I think one third is the estimate. We don't have numbers because we started with this project last year, and we needed to get the numbers updated. But that's about what the estimate was, and that was for a full field turf. We did talk about doing just the infield. Um, but if we did just the infield, then we wouldn't be able to use it for other sports. Um, we had, we did also talk to um, Amy Schooneman about the um, what she envisions we could use the field for, and she's thinking that we could use it for um, soccer in the fall, when um, it wouldn't be, you know, there wouldn't be any baseball at that time. We can also use it for um, lacrosse workouts in the fall, and we can start using it for softball and baseball um, in the spring. And she would. Um, she was thinking about reserving a particular time slot in the um, in, in the afternoons for the school district, so that um, she would have that available for whatever sport was needing it during that time. And the time frame would, as you mentioned, there's lights, so they would be able to go later um, in the spring um, to use that field. So um, some of those things are things that we had considered. Um, and I think you mentioned the drainage issue that they have there, um, and we had talked earlier about costs, there are some considerable costs associated with fixing the drainage um, in the field now so that that would no longer happen um, and the turf would resolve that issue. So let's go back to the fall permits that you brought up. Um, same thing with spring permits. When we go for fall permits at Wesley Ross, it's always a competition between us and NHAA. And when I try to get a game rescheduled because something got rained out because we do operate that for the club team, I, I always hear there's no slots available. Every cool. slot is used, and that's a constant thing. So, and this is for it, Herb Field? It, yes, it is. Okay. okay. I well, hope we, those kind of things w yeah. going to work out. I, I understand sure. that, but, but, but I've already heard f like three board or four board members saying they're really in favor, and I really beg you to look at every option including well, putting a tarp on and put it, putting I drainage in it before we as a school district make that commitment. I, I, I think of, it's safe to say there are people who are in favor of it, not at any cost, right. but with given conditions. Oh, I'm in favor if, if the township wants to do it or we want to charge outside sources to maybe yeah. well, make but, up but that cost. But and, her, and her group in conjunction with the township is going really yeah. to work those things it's, out and we'll have a chance. And to we are working those. with Westview Ross and yeah. the North House Athletic Association yeah. and the soccer. As and been. this to me just represents an opportunity for a lot of groups to come together to maybe try to resolve some of those problems sure, yeah. that everybody have had. So, you know, I don't think that, you know, Sandy is suggesting that we have, or anybody is suggesting that we have all the answers and we right. have all the information right. and that anybody is ready to vote on this. But I think, you know, there are some number of us that are interested in, you know, trying to see what we can do, you know, what kind of partnerships we might be able to work out to see if it makes sense. You know, as Pat yep. put it, if it's something that, you know, we can't we you know neither of us can afford it none of these organizations can afford it to, you know alone can we work together to come up with something that is affordable so that's what we're that's the question we're trying to answer yet and I mean the reason that we brought it up at this time was so that we could discuss these kinds of issues that are of concern to the board and, that, and that's what I'm unity. what I'm here for is that right. I would be glad to provide you my insight to any of that because I've been around here a long time and I kind of yeah. 
know how to maintain fields and there's certain ways to do it and there's certain ways that we even have trouble with directing parents how to pick up a rake and do it right. They don't know how to do it right, to be honest with you. And we, we rely on volunteers, and there's a lot of work that goes into that. Ed, I don't know if you were on Westview Ross or active in Westview Ross when <clears throat> I was years ago and we had the tarp at Charmin Field, and that was a disaster because um, you can throw a tarp down. It's a great idea. Nobody ever throws it back down. Um, it's more headache than it is help because nobody will roll it up. Nobody will roll it back. They walk on top of it. They tear it. They rip it. They take no care of it. So you go out there and you spend a couple thousand dollars on a tarp that lasts maybe two rainfalls, and then you got to end up have holes all through it, puddles all in the infield. Tarps don't work in this area unless you've got a full-time maintenance crew that's going to do that's going to roll that tarp, take care of that tarp. And I know Ross Township's not going to do and, that. And, and, and I'm going to beg to differ with you. We can go over to Kennedy but, Township and see how they well, operate Kennedy their Township. Tarp. I'm talking but, Ross Township, Westview Ross. We've been there. I've done that. Okay. Well, you I, get, I we, say we still we'll explore get these, it. We'll get these details. Anything else? Thanks, Mr. Vesley. Okay. Anybody else? Mr. Nudie has a comment. Mr. Nudie? Mr. Vesley, I thought Mr. Burnett was going to get you some bleachers. No, no. Benches. Benches I have. Okay. I have benches for him. Yeah, okay. You have what? I have benches for him, benches. but I didn't oh, have bleachers. I thought you were going to get bleachers. Oh, okay. Our bleachers came from Ross Township okay. up at Charmin, but the, ble the benches came from um, Dave Marinick many, many years ago. Okay. Okay, so, so that's not going to help us at McIntyre. No, but the beat, I mean, you can have the bench. The benches are already over there, Ed? Two benches, and I think I had a total. I had four benches, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that would really help the parents. That's what okay. we're really looking for. You need a place yeah. to start. Dr. Manorino. I know. 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 I we we do look at that every year. Unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't right. make it. But yeah. Still, oh, and I know it's, it's on the it's on the list. Everything Absolutely. is the red pen. But let's just <laughs> name and address, please. Right now, Fire. there's a lot of stuff on the on the budget. Steve so Corbel, four zero eight Sangri Road. Uh, I'm the president of the Ross Township Board of Commissioners, and uh, I'm just here to, to for two reasons. One, to thank the district for their willingness to work together with us on both the Herb Field issue and a revenue enhancement issue. Um, I, I truly believe that we are stronger when we work together, and I know that we can do better at that, and I'm committed, and I know my uh, colleagues on the Board of Commissioners are committed to do that as well. And then, then secondly, I just wanted to, if I could, take a moment to correct the record. You know, we, we live in the era of fake news and alternative facts, and the township is not three or five years behind in road paving. We have spent over $2 million for the last three years. We are caught up, we are ahead, and we are making this township better every single day. So Mr. Nudy, if you'd like to talk about road paving, please call me anytime, and I'll make sure that you know exactly where we are. I, I Thanks, talked to everybody. your township manager, and I was given the story that he could do nothing for me. So. Well, you I don't know going. about your significance, your issue, but we, you said that we are three or five years behind in well, road that, paving, that's, that's and that's right. why you won't that's support Herb Field or put money towards got, Herb Field. That's that information is, I got from commissioners. That is not the case. I got that is not the case. From commissioners, so. Okay. That's not Thank the case. Thank you, Mr. Corbell. You're welcome. That being said, I am going to uh, motion that we end the meeting. Second. <laughs> second. That's <laughs> my first second. Wait, I Let's have some discussion. Some Can we discuss yeah. that? Yeah. Let's have some discussion. So we have a night. <laughs> meeting adjourned. <laughs> we can't discuss that, Ed?